Enrico Callender. Here. Frank Mietzke. Here. Eric Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Hui Tran. Jeremy Barus. Here. Jose Posadas. Lun Diep. Linda Lazat, Luis Barosio, here. Magnolia Siegel, here. Maria Fuentes, here. Sammy Robledo, Sherry Segura, T. Tran, Tobin Gilman. Here. Veronica Amador. Here. Yong Zhao. And Frederick Ferrer. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to take a motion to approve the consent calendar, which includes the minutes of August 9th and the process minutes from August 23rd, and receive all and file the letters from the public. Um, at this time, to can I get a motion to approve? Commissioner, this Tran. is Commissioner Hui Tran. Oh, so move, so moved, and also to note for the record that I am here. Thank you, Commissioner Hugh Tran is in attendance, and she, that's a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Fuentes. Were you seconding, or do you have a comment? I was seconding. Thank second. you. Thank you. Mr. Percival, you can do it. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. Um, at this time, I'd like to open the um, up for public comment on the consent calendar. Anybody in the public wish to address the commission on the consent calendar? I have Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Boy, this is going to be a heavy meeting because, uh, well, I'm not so sure. I can understand the thinking. Um, well, first, let me uh, uh, try to describe. I'd like to speak on the minutes process. And, uh, you know, you, you offered ideas in the minutes about uh, the future of policing and reimagine. This is going to be a heavy meeting today to, uh, you know, I think there can be ways to create a, a broad overview of the future of reimagine, equity, and open democracy that, that respects its purposes. I hope we can work towards those things still, even uh, to respect the, what the city manager's report will try to say. Um, with that said, from the last meeting, um, you know, there are questions about uh, uh, the, the public hearings on, on Thursday where the subcommittee processes wasn't mentioned at all in the agendas or in the reporting. Uh, we learned to have to learn how to take the steps to share in the agenda that there was a subcommittee process on the items we talked about at, at, at then at the public hearing process. Uh, those steps have to be included in the future of this uh, public meeting process. We have to learn how to do that. I'll talk more about uh, police and reimagine issues uh, when it comes up on this item tonight. Um, I think there's, there's ways we can work to respect uh, all sides. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Tessa Woodmetzi. Thank you. Yes, um, well, in terms of protocols about the way these meetings are going and to have um, the city, you know, like we learned um, last week in our pu public hearing, uh, it was about uh, the commissions and the commission, the history of our commissions is to get more public engagement and public comment. And, and um, it is, you know, our government for the people and by the people. And so this is where our commissions come in. And so when you have a city manager saying that we're going, you know, to say this is what needs to go on to our agenda, that is wrong. You know, you know, I'm not saying that her content of dealing with the policing and, you know, safety is not an issue. But these, these are issues. This is a, a commission by the people and for the people. And so it shouldn't be the protocols of having in any way reducing the, the leadership 
of this subcommittee, which is in, in tonight's meeting, was you know hardly given to our third leg of our subcommittee. We didn't even get a fair share, which I've written about. That you know the, the, the people's agenda was was short short shrift. And then to say that the the city manager, which is staff, should have any input about the way the meeting goes. You know, this should be by the the subcommittee chair is how we set up our meetings. And that is for the people. And there's no way that, you know, we should be discussing this issue when we have this critical issue of our climate crisis on the agenda. And to say that now we're going to ad address the, the issue of, of pu public safety, which is very critical, but it shouldn't be ruled by our, our city manager. That is not the way these, these meetings are supposed to be going. This is for the people and by the people. That's what the commission is about. And so it needs to be, um, you know, we need to have open democracy about this, just like how rules decides beforehand what the commission deals with. We Paul Soto. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Soto from the Horse Show. I'm not sure if uh, Senora uh, Matsumura is here. But I would like to at least state to the committee itself that my outburst at the last meeting, that it was out of order, that it was out of line, I was wrong, and that I will do my very best not to disrespect the process like that again. I, and, and I mean that sincerely. I, I just wanted to start off that way. Secondly, um, I share uh, Blair's concerns that there are committee subcommittee meetings being conducted but they're not centered within the context of these minutes. So really, to tell you the truth, the minutes that you have before you, they're not legitimate. That's number one. Number two is that the, the conversation really concerns me, the, the way that it flowed the last time. Jeff Buchanan came in at public comment, okay, and then, and then somebody else jumped on what he wanted done, then it got put on hold, and then at the end of the meeting, it, it was it, it was on people's minds. Then it got revisited. Then all of a sudden, uh, people were in accord. Mr. Callender came in like kind of like a, a little bit late on that. And then what he did is he actually squared it properly by stating that, um, uh, hey, uh, do we get public comment on this? I've reviewed the uh, tape three times. Public comment was not taken on it because it was not an agendized item. It came out through the uh, public comment. So the minutes that you have before you, if you agree to allow those into the record, then it, it calls into question the legitimacy of these meetings. The, and, and that's just as simple as it gets. And that concerns me because you were the people that are in authority of the Luke. Hi, yes, I'm calling in, uh, because of the letter that the city manager sent in on Friday trying to shut down the okay, subcommittee. That, excuse me, that's um, agendized for uh, the study session. This the, We're doing public comment on consent calendar right now. Did you still want to speak right, on consent calendar? I would like to speak on what I was speaking on. Okay. Can you restart my time since you interrupted yes. me? Thank you. Okay, as I was saying, <clears throat> since the city manager and I'm assuming the mayor wanted to butt in and try and shut down the subcommittee to try and get us a, a police oversight committee. Um, first of all, on, only saying that it's because reimagining public safety is also going to be re making a recommendation and this is being done without having consulted reimagining public safety and the members of its organization they just sent this out on friday it's a complete you know it's 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 completely backhanded thing to do especially when the thing that the city tried to put together completely and epically failed and all the major leaders of the city walked away from it so uh this definitely needs to be addressed this is priority number one uh Please don't cut off anybody else that talks about this. It's extremely rude. What the community wants to talk about is what the community wants to talk about. And I, that's, I, you know what, I yield the rest of my time. 
there's no further comments for consent. Thank you. Then we can take a vote on the consent calendar. Will the clerk take the roll, please? Or take the vote, please. Yes, uh, beginning with Barbara Marshman. Uh, yes. Christina Johnson. Yes. Elizabeth Monley. Uh, yes. Ellie Monsamura. Uh, I have to abstain for some reason. I can't. I can't find the minutes to review them. Enrico Calendar. Aye. Frank Kamitsky. Yes. Garrick Percival. Yes. George Sanchez. Hui Tran. Yes. Jeremy Barus. Yes. Jose Posadas. Lund Diet. Hmm. Linda Lazat. Luis Barosio. Yes. Magnolia Siegel. Yes. Maria Fuentes. Yes. Samuel Robledo. Sherry Segura. Yes. T. Tran. Tobin Gilman. Yes. Veronica Amador. I'm also going to be abstaining. I need to re-watch the meeting. Thank you. Yong Zhao. Yes. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us to old business since we have about 20 minutes before, 15 minutes before our study session begins. Um, I wasn't at the August 23rd meeting, so I can't comment on that, but I wanted to make sure that folks have um, received the letter that I received from the city manager's office and have reviewed that. We'll take that up when we take up the, um, the questions on the subcommittees, um, but that's the only thing I had is in terms of um, uh, my report out back to the commission. Uh, does the clerk have a, a memo to report on or anything to report on? Um, the only thing I, I really have to report on is we want, I wanted to kind of talk about meetings going forward, um, hybrid versus virtual. Um, AB 361 is a bill that was just approved in the Assembly and Senate to extend the Brown Act exemptions during states of emergency. Um, once the governor signs that, and it looks like he will, it passed with two thirds vote. Um, if the governor signs it, then we will not need to go into in-person hybrid meetings. We can remain virtual as long as the emergency is declared. That's my big update. As soon as I know, as soon as it's signed, I will, will let all of you know. Um, but my the indications that we've heard is that the governor will sign it. Thank you. And I wanted to ask the the um, the city attorney, did you have anything to report on? Are you done at this time? Um, I've asked the city attorney to, um, to, to send us a memo about the same issue in terms of the um, making sure that we understand the legal standings that we have as a commission around um, the, the actions on the police issues to make sure that this, uh, this commission has the proper authority. Um, so I've asked the city attorney to make sure that we have his opinion to make to uh, for the commission's discussion. Um, and then finally, we have... Um, Chair, we have a, a, a Commissioner Matsumura has her hand up. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, I had, a, sorry, a, a couple of questions, if that's okay, um, since we've quickly touched on a, product, a couple of issues. Um, one for the city clerk, thank you very much for that update. I had... Um, uh, seen AB 339, but not, I think it was AB 361, you said? Yes, um, 361. Okay, and so, and I did thank you to both you and uh, Ms. Roche for the information that you shared with me about, you know, potential options for hybrid meetings and COVID safety going forward. So I do remember that that memo highlighted 
an issue of um, the location of each member of a legislative body needing to be disclosed uh, if, if hybrid meetings or virtual meetings were to continue. So AB 361 addresses that issue? Yes, so okay. that, will not be, um, that will not be part of it. So okay. we would be able to hold meetings exactly the way we are now, talking with the, the EOC people who are in charge of you know, the COVID response. They want to keep all boards and commissions virtual, as well as all council committee meetings. We'll continue to do hybrid city council meetings at this time, but everything else will remain virtual. Um, so as long as the governor signs it, so I, that there's that English major in me that doesn't like to talk in absolutes. So I, I don't want to count my my signature before it's signed. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you for playing that out a little bit more. Um, the other question is is for the chair, just because I'm still orienting myself to how we're running this agenda, especially because I know we have a time certain on the study session. My understanding. Um, from members of the public we've heard from one of them so far is is that there are quite a number of people um interested in speaking on the issue of of the letter from the city manager um you know and when it's possible i always think it's great to minimize the number of people who are uh waiting for their item to come up is is there a way that we would be able to um to to take those public comments as soon as possible and, and I'm hoping either the, the chair, consultant, or clerk or attorney could help out um, with, with how that's possible given the agenda that's posted. Unless the clerk can tell me something different, we have a time certain of the study session that has been posted with the time slots uh, allocated. Our Thursday night session went much quicker than was scheduled, so I'm hoping that continues tonight, which would get us to being able to open up the discussion around the timing on the recommendations in which I think it's germane that the letter from the city manager is germane. germane. Um, and I think that would affect our decision making. I, I would think it would influence your decision making around the timing. So I could open up the, um, I could open up to the public to speak to that issue at that time. Um, but it would be right after our um, our two speakers and the Q and A from commissioners and the public comment on the two issues that are being heard, the two speakers that are being heard tonight. I I do wonder if members of that subcommittee um, have any thoughts on this, uh, just given that you know these are both issues that your subcommittee is is leading on, and just how we can you know respect the time of the speakers and also make the best use of the, the time of the members of the public who uh, who are joining us tonight. And yeah, unless this, unless the clerk can tell me a way to do that, I don't, we have a published agenda that I think I need to follow. So unless the clerk tells me there's some other way to do it, that's the fastest I think I can do it. So um, Clerk Tabor, do you have anything to add? Well, we've, we've, when we have a time certain and it's it's a time certain, it's not a not to be heard before, we want to pause discussion and, and take the item at six. And we've also, you know, it's also in respect for the speakers who are expecting that time. Thank you. I was only familiar with not to be heard before rather than time certain. Is there an option to take some of those comments now before the, the six o'clock hour? I would hate to, I would hate to do that on an item that's not on the agenda right now because we're not discussing it. Here, here's my challenge: is if we open that up and then I'm going to cut everybody off in ten minutes, then I think that becomes a challenge. But I, but I'm moving to the six o'clock time certain. And our speaker is here for, I believe our first speaker is present. Yeah, it's um, Michael Mastrandrea. I may have butchered that name. We and would need to, we need to, do I, oh, we need to wait. We have I need to wait till six. Yeah, okay. 
We do um, have hands up to um, speak on the reports from the chair, clerk, and city attorney, though. I, I still have a report. Um, right. And I mean, I guess I could do that during the work plan section, Fred, if you want. I was just going to come to you as the last one because we just finished the attorney's one. So I was okay. going to finish with that. And that's what I was going to do in this last nine minutes. Okay. I can certainly do it in five minutes. Well, let me jump in. Um, the meeting on the 23rd, uh, there was a discussion amongst commissioners to um, move forward. Um, uh, recommendations for the timing of the mayoral election um, uh, and basically fast track that uh, as well as um, some discussion about sort of the interrelationship between voting and elections and governance structure uh, recommendations as directed came back with a set of options to move forward the timing of, of uh, those recommendations. This was sent out to you all on Friday and posted to the agenda, I believe. Um, we are uh, recommending that all of the sets of recommendations from a given subcommittee be moved forward together because they were presented, discussed, and provisionally voted on together. Um, and what I've tried to do is lay out three options, which are uh, continue on the current timeline to submit all recommendations by December 14th uh, to deliver um, two reports, uh, which includes voting and elections and governance structure. Um, which would be delivered um, uh, about a month and a half earlier. Um, so the, the timing of mayoral elections would be delivered a month and a half earlier, or three reports, um, which would get voting in elections about uh, two months earlier than the current schedule. So um, this is the current schedule pulled out of the work plan. Uh, you'll see December 14th, final report, report delivered to council. The last commission meeting for discussion would be November 29th, and um, the uh, my team, myself, and, and city clerk would need uh, at least two weeks, and this is about what we have, to uh, finish that final report, submit it to council, get ready for posting, et cetera. The, the second option is um, to combine voting and elections and governance structure and move those forward together. Uh, that would look like uh, essentially um, uh, moving up the the having a provisional vote on governance structure recommendations um, with the discussion of public hearing feedback and then on uh, on October 4th and then October 18th do final voting on voting and elections and governance structure recommendations uh, and that would um, give us the time to combine that uh, compile that into a final report and deliver to council um, again with with a clerk support for posting and then there would be uh, after the the discussion of the policing municipal law accountability inclusion recommendations and the public hearing uh, in early November, there'd be a discussion and provisional voting in on November 15th. And then we added the additional meeting on November 18th, where we would do the, um, the um, provisional voting. Um, uh, actually, I see I have provisional voting twice here. So this would be um, basically um, uh, this would be additional discussion and or provisional voting for policing municipal law and accountability. Apologies for that uh, oversight. But the, the bottom line here is that final voting would be at the end of November and that this, the, the second report in this option of two reports would be delivered by the same deadline of no December 14th. That might give the commission a little more uh, freedom to talk about the discussion uh, and space to, to talk about the discussion, uh, the recommendations and discuss them for the, the, the third topic of policing municipal law accountability and inclusion uh, and get the other recommendations off the table to, to free up a, a more focused conversation and finish out the the tenure of the commission. The third option is to submit three separate reports for each focus area or subcommittee. Uh, the first would be to do to move up final voting on uh, voting and election recommendations to Monday, uh, along with the initial discussion of governance structure recommendations, and then to do the um, uh, by October 8th, 8th, which would again be uh, a little over two weeks to deliver that final report on voting and elections to the council. Um, and then the timing for everything else is the same provisional voting on governance structure after the public hearing and, and the discussion. Um, there would be another report, the second report delivered on October 29th for uh, governance structure recommendations. Sorry, I see another error in here. Um, 
so um, this uh, October 29th would be report number two. And then finally, uh, again, the, the, the last two months, uh, or actually um, month, uh, would be dedicated to discussing the, the third topic of policing municipal law, accountability and inclusion, uh, the public hearing, discussion, uh, two actually two meetings of discussion and then and then voting and then delivering the final report. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on those different options. Uh, this is what we uh, came up with based on the conversation with you all on the 23rd. And we'll have about three minutes to, to get into that. So we'll have to pause conversation once we get to the six minute mark. Uh, and I see um, Commissioner Magnolia. Thank you. Um, I don't see where the half day is. The extra half. So today is a half day for education, and then we... and we—that's something that we can discuss when we get to the work plan. This was, that half day was not included um, when I when I drafted this. So, uh, as per your request, I, I wanted to the commission to to talk about that together and vote on that together. So we would need to. There is time, as mentioned. We've got um, um, uh, in in all options. We've got some time in. To, to address that so we can talk about what those options are uh, when we get to the discussion of the work plan uh, after study session. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, it seems like maybe some of those errors that you made instead of, you know, removing those, we could just add that as the timing. Um, there was yeah, some there's their space for sure. We'll, we'll get it in. Thank great. you. Uh, Commissioner Quitran. Um, you know, just recognizing the amount of work that has to kind of be done to uh, Maybe one simpler item could be just to forward the one time sensitive issue to the council, uh, right? Which is the timing of the timing of mayoral elections, right? I mean, I imagine that would be the one thing that uh, is there has to be time than everything else. If we need to take a little bit more time to manage workflow, can't we just separate out that one item and moving it ahead and move it ahead? Yeah, I mean, frankly, uh, as far as actually compiling the report, you know, there as much as we can do ahead of time and and get this into, uh, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily rush this rush discussion, but we are sort of in the tail end of of discussion and 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 need to be starting to to finalize recommendations. The more time that that uh, I and the city clerk have to to put these reports together is is welcome and, and appreciated. Um, and and I think the the bigger so that that's one I think recommendation I have for the commission is just at this point to move as much forward as possible as soon as possible um, thematically I think it does make sense at least for you know voting in elections and maybe governance structure I, I realize the third topic of policing municipal law uh, accountability and inclusion even by, given its title or name is is broad um, and so there may not even be a theme in that. To, topic area, but I think trying to, to move these forward and deliver reports that that have uh, some um, cohesion to them as far as what's being recommended would probably be welcome by council. And, and I, the last thing I'll say um, that I know that the council is eager to get the those first, the, it's the, the first four uh, directives from the original memo. Um, uh, which we've bucketed, bucketed into the, the first, the, the two topics of voting in elections and governance structure. So um, that again is, is, is my strong recommendation and, and the, the clerk and the chair uh, agree with that uh, because you know, it's, you know, that, that's the recommendation and I'll leave it on the table. Sure. Uh, and one follow-up clarifying question. Uh, we had, we're at six o'clock, so okay. um, I'll defer to the chair if we wanna just take- we'll come, we'll come right back to you, Commissioner Tran, when we come back. At this time, I want to open the study session, and our first speaker tonight uh, is Michael Mastrandrea. I hope I didn't uh, butcher your name too badly, sir. Um, a climate scientist from Stanford University. Um, as we have two speakers tonight in the study session, as we've been doing for the last study session, they will each have their allotted time. Then we'll go to Q&A, um, and then we'll have the second speaker, and then we'll go to the commissioner's Q&A, and then we'll open it up for public comment. So, uh, Michael, go ahead and take it away. Thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. And first, let me ask, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Well, first, I want to thank Commissioner Siegel and, and the Commission as a whole for inviting me to speak this evening. I am the Research Director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program at Stanford University, the Woods Institute for the Environment. And I'm a climate scientist who works on climate risks and resilience and also climate and energy policy. 
I was part of the leadership team for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC fifth assessment report that was released several years ago. And I've been asked to speak today about the findings of the new IPCC report that has just been released and some of its implications. So this is the report that was released last month. Uh, this is the first installment of a global assessment of climate science. Um, and this part of the report focuses on the physical science basis, basically how we understand as scientists the climate system, how it works, how human activities are changing the climate. And uh, over the, the period of the last uh, IPCC process, they uh, run these reports every six or seven years approximately. And uh, each time it is an assessment of what is the latest state of understanding of, of, of what we know about the climate system. And so in this uh, last time frame, advances in climate science, science have given scientists a better understanding of our past and our present climate, and also new tools to explore what the world would look like at different levels of warming in the future. Briefly, for context, the IPCC was created in the late 1980s by the uh, World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. It's a, a somewhat unique organization globally. Its members are the governments of the world, uh, but those who write the reports are the scientists of the world. And its objective is to provide governments with policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive information, again, about uh, climate science and its implications. And the volunteer scientists from around the world come together to write chapters that assess what is known about climate change, its impacts and risks, and also how policy actions, adaptation, and mitigation or reducing greenhouse gas emissions can reduce those risks. I, I show these two pictures because I just briefly want to mention that particularly in areas of science like climate science, where we are trying to understand a complex system like the Earth system and the climate as it changes. Science is often presented as a kind of the, the one, the, the figure you see on the left here is a house of cards where you have a hypothesis and you do an experiment. And if you get results that confirm your hypothesis, you keep going. And if you get results that indicate something different, then you sort of throw everything out and, and start over. And, that's not really how it works in, in a lot of areas of science, but, and, and climate science is a great example. There are many types of experiments and other types of scientific research that give us different pieces of our understanding of the climate system. And it's much more like a, a jigsaw puzzle where we're putting those pieces together and understand the overall picture, even when there's still some uncertainties about specific aspects that we're still understanding better as new research comes in. As I mentioned briefly, for the IPCC process, the report that was just released is the first installment that looks at the, the, the basic science of climate change. There are two more reports that will be released early next year that focus more on climate impacts and adaptation, and then also on climate mitigation, on policies and strategies for reducing emissions that are causing climate change. Okay, so the first uh, conclusion from the report that I wanted to highlight is that Climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. And there are many, many examples of this, but this is one of the, the highest level conclusions of, of this report that was just released. I'll show a few examples and happy to dig in more in the, in the question uh, period. So this is a, a figure that shows global temperatures uh, over time, starting in the late 19th century and then going through the present day. And you can see that those uh, temperatures are increasing over time and particularly in the last 40 or 50 years have really been uh, increasing substantially and are now at, at the highest levels that we've seen in that kind of a Sorry period. to interrupt the, um, we can't quite see the slides. They're very much zoomed in, zoomed in so much. We, we I see, that's strange. All right, let me try a different way of sharing. One second. Uh, I, I don't think I'm having that same if you if you're on Zoom and you go to this slide, uh, if you slide the table over, if you move your uh, cursor to right next to the last photos blocks, just move that line. There's a double line there. You'll see, and you can move. You can make the uh, commissioners smaller, but the the slide larger. So I think so can others others can see the the full slide at this right. point. Yeah. So okay. Slide, slide's fine. Thank you, great. I also wanted to show 
how that is playing out in California, that, that global uh, trend in temperature that, uh, that I just mentioned. And this is a figure from the last California climate change assessment that was released in, in 2018 uh, by the state government um, and showing historical changes in temperatures in different parts of California. And you, you see as well that there's been market increases in, in most of California as well. This is not just about average temperatures, but also changes in extreme heat uh, looking now across the U.S. at different places, including uh, uh, some data for the Bay Area, there have been uh, increases in both the number of heat waves uh, in many parts of, of the nation, as well as when heat waves occur, how intense they are, how hot the temperatures are. And it's also not just about temperature. Um, the, the warming temperatures globally and in different parts of the world are also causing a, a range of other changes that, that impact our, our cities and, and our uh, communities and our health. Uh, one example, again, is, is sea level rise. This is showing global sea levels, um, which have increased about eight inches, a little more than half a foot, um, since, again, uh, record keeping began in the late 19th century. And this is a, a one of the kinds of, of impacts that is expected to, to continue and, and potentially to accelerate in the future. There's also a, a range of other kinds of, of impacts that um, play out in different ways in different parts of the world. And, and I wanted to spend a few minutes mentioning some of the, them that are important for California and for the Western US. You, uh, I'm sure, know that we get a lot of our rain and our snow in the wintertime here and not very much in, in other parts of, of the year. And we in California and other parts of the West rely a lot on the snow that builds up over the wintertime and then melts uh, over a much longer period of time and fuels our rivers, uh, fuels our reservoirs for, for drinking water, for agricultural purposes, for producing electricity from hydropower. And what we're seeing is that more uh, in the wintertime, because of warmer temperatures, more of that uh, snow is instead falling as rain. And then it's also running off and melting earlier in the year, again, because of warmer temperatures, which leaves less available, particularly in the drier later summer months when uh, are some of the times when we need that water the most. Drought conditions related very much to, to what I was just talking about with snowpack have also been a, a big concern um, uh, in many of the, the recent years and including this year. And that has also been a contributor to uh, major trends in, in wildfires that we've all been living with, particularly for the last several years here in California, which is not just about the direct impacts of those, those wildfires and the areas in which they're burning and all of the destruction that they cause, but also the smoke impacts. And, and this is a, a figure, I'm sure if any of you were in the Bay Area last year, this was uh, just a few days more than a year ago um, the, when we had smoke in the air that caused a day when in where I was living, the, the sun just didn't come up and, and my children were wondering what was going on when they were trying to go to school um, over Zoom and, and seeing that it was dark outside. And uh, this of course has profound uh, public health impacts and, and, and health impacts for those who aren't able to be in areas that are, are protected from the smoke in the air. Okay, so I wanted to talk just a few minutes as well about why we know that this is something that's not a natural cycle and why it's really, why we know that it's, it's something that's really being really driven by human activities. And I'll give a couple of examples of this, happy to talk more about this if there's questions. Um, one aspect of that is that many of the changes, and this is again a conclusion from the IPCC report, many of the changes observed in the climate in the period that I've been talking about are, are unprecedented in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, if you look back further into Earth's history. One example of this from the report, uh, this is now looking at temperatures again globally and if you can see my cursor on the right hand side, uh, there's a black line that talks about observed temperatures. That's basically the same as the first uh, graph that I showed you of rising temperatures, where this is the period where we have thermometers and, and then more recently satellites and other records where we can directly measure the temperatures. Scientists have other ways to look further back in time through proxies, ice cores, or lake sediments, or a variety of other um, features of the Earth that can be used to understand what the temperature was further back in time. And so this is now looking about 2,000 years into the past, showing temperatures and showing that the, the warming that we're seeing now is really something that is both much more rapid and also much larger than any of the kinds of changes that were observed in that previous period. If you look further back in time, this is now looking at 
CO2, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, which is really the primary greenhouse gas that comes from burning fossil fuels, oil, uh, natural gas, coal, um, and other activities like deforestation. If this is now looking 800,000 years into the past through a period when the earth went through uh, a cycle, several cycles of ice ages and then warmer periods. And that's this kind of up and down uh, that you can see in the graph. Over that period, there was a range of, of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, but you can see that if you're looking at where on the right hand side, where concentrations are now, they're much higher and they're also far above any of these kinds of variations that have been observed over this period due to other kinds of, of natural factors. At this point, it's, it's also, and this is, I, I think, one of the most important uh, conclusions from this uh, physical science IPCC report. It, uh, the, the conclusion is that it, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Um, unequivocal is a word that scientists hardly ever use. Scientists generally speak in probabilities or uncertainties and, and talk about all of the reasons why they're not, they can't say for certain that something is occurring. But I think this is really one of the strongest words that I've, I've seen scientists use in this re respect and really communicates that this is a fact that's undisputed at this point. There's really no question and overwhelming evidence that human activities are, are really what's driving all of the changes that we've observed that I've just been talking about. To give you a couple of examples of, of why that is, um, this is a quick primer on the carbon cycle, and I'm going to go really quickly, but I just wanted to mention a few uh, highlights of this figure. Um, what we are doing when we are burning oil and gas and coal and, and fossil fuels and also uh, removing forests or, or leading to other uh, releases of carbon from, from natural ecosystems is that we're adding carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the air. That's these up arrows on the left-hand side. Some of that is being taken back out of the atmosphere into the ocean and into plants as they grow. That's the down arrows that you're seeing here. But that's only about half of what's going into the atmosphere. And so over time, there's more and more of the greenhouse gases that are accumulating in, in the atmosphere. And you, over time, you can see that those concentrations in the atmosphere are, are just going up and up every year. That is really the, 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 the core of what's uh, driving climate change and the warming temperatures and other changes that I talked about. If you, you we only have one Earth, and so we can't really do controlled experiments on, on our Earth, uh, but we can use models and, uh, and uh, computer models to simulate what might happen with under different scenarios. And, and what this experiment is showing is that the black line, again, is temperatures that we've observed in, in the Earth uh, globally. And uh, two sets of, of model simulations. The tan bars um, and tan area is showing uh, running these models with all of the different factors that we know have influenced the climate, both the human factors, uh, burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and also natural factors like changes in the amount of energy that comes from the sun or major volcanic eruptions that can cool the climate uh, for short, short periods. Um, and you can see that the, when you include both the human and natural components, you can um, see temperatures that are basically similar to what we've actually observed. If you take away the human, uh, human uh, factors, uh, the burning of fossil fuels and, and other factors, you instead get this green bar down here. You really can't explain the warming that we've seen, particularly over the last 40 or 50 years. So this is just another example of, of some of the evidence that's available. There, there's other um, things to mention. I want to transition now to talk a little bit about how we think about understanding possible future outcomes. We, we all know that we can't predict the future, but we can think about what might be the implications of different choices and what might be the risks or, uh, or the benefits associated with different possible futures. And three more of the uh, conclusions coming out of this IPCC, IPCC report. Um, First, uh, future changes to our climate and how they affect us depend on the choices we make today. So even though some amount of climate change we're already seeing um, that has many risks associated with it, in my opinion, and also uh, there is an amount of climate change that's baked into the system because of the inertia of the system, we also have a lot of uh, ability to affect what world we're going to live in in the future and to avoid many of the future risks by taking action. 
Um, that is the, the theme of the second uh, bullet here. Strong and sustained reductions in emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases would limit climate change. And uh, a stronger statement, uh, the bottom one that I want to mention is that unless there is, the, the report concludes that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius, this is warming above where we started, will be beyond reach. Those uh, thresholds are, are um, relevant and important in an international climate policy uh, context because they are the ones that are named in the Paris Agreement that was passed in 2015, an agreement of governments of the world to commit to uh, limiting climate change and limiting the amount of warming globally to below those thresholds, which were chosen because of the risks that are seen to be associated with, um, with, with a temperature rise of that amount. In the IPCC report, they use, again, climate models that I was talking about before to run different scenarios into the future. And uh, what I wanted to highlight here is those scenarios could either be very high emission scenarios where we continue to burn lots of fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase over time from where they are today uh, over this is looking out to the end of this century. Or uh, in more of a policy scenario, emissions could either be relatively flat and then start to come down or uh, come down much more, more quickly um, and even go into a, a negative range through various technologies. If you look at the temperature implications of those same scenarios, which again are down here at the bottom, um, the uh, blue lines I've drawn across the, the top of the figure are where the uh, 1.5 and the 2 degrees Celsius thresholds are, again, that we mentioned before, and really only the scenarios that show immediate and sustained emissions reductions limit overall warming to below those thresholds, the ones where uh, uh, emissions either stay flat and even start to go down later in the century or continue to go up do not meet those thresholds. In the next few decades, they cross those thresholds. And that's the basis for those, those findings that I was talking about before. I think it's fair to say that this, uh, uh, this is a conclusion that there is urgency in reducing emissions. This is on a global basis, but I think, as I'll mention a little bit more in a minute, it applies locally as well. Lastly, on these future outcomes, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the part of the IPCC report that focuses on climate impacts and risks hasn't been released yet. It will be released next year. But this is a conclusion from the last report, the one that I worked on that was released a few years ago, highlighting that increasing magnitudes of warming increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts. And so again, I think this is about the, the urgency of taking action now. And I wanted to include one slide that highlights some of the kinds of impacts that we're already starting to see, but, but that are expected to intensify here in California and, and here in the Bay Area. Um, many of those relate to the kinds of extremes that I was talking about earlier. Um, also, I think the concerns for public health and also disruptions to um, our economy and to infrastructure. Um, the uh, also sea level rise, I would say, is another one where there are um, significant concerns and, and already action being taken in some ways to think about um, how the bay uh, will continue to impact our coastlines. Lastly, I wanted to speak a little bit about climate solutions. And um, while this is a global problem where globally the solutions will need to occur everywhere in the world to truly address and to fully address climate change, I think that also means that it's important for there to be action in, everywhere, including here. And also, uh, I think what we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years is that California and its cities have an outsized influence on climate solutions globally. And California has really been, a, and its cities have really been leaders um, in uh, understanding how you can actually craft policies to reduce emissions and also to uh, prepare for and, and address the, the impacts of climate change. As, as you probably know, California has set ambitious goals um, for reducing its own emissions. Um, this is highlighting a few of them. So uh, a 2020 target to return emissions to where they were in 1990, a 2030 target that is to reduce emissions 40% below that. Um, those are both legally binding targets that have been passed into law. There are also a, a variety of executive orders that have been set by uh, several of the, the recent governors of the state 
to aim for deep reductions or to uh, for carbon neutrality, bringing emissions to a point where um, in, in they are at a net zero, where essentially there are no emissions if you also take out uh, take into account how much has, is being removed um, from the atmosphere. Um, these are the, the, the goals that the California has set. Um, and this is the progress to date in terms of, of emissions in California overall. Uh, from a peak in the early 2000s, emissions have been declining um, since then over the last 10 to 15 years. And it, it's a, a, a success to mention that California has passed below or reduced emissions more than its 2020 goal four years early and in 2016. But if you look ahead, there's still quite a bit of work to be done. And so this is now looking ahead to 2030 and where the 2030 target is, which is an ambitious, as I mentioned, 40% reduction below where the 2020 uh, uh, limit was. And emissions uh, reductions that have been occurring have to uh, continue and, and even accelerate if we're going to be successful in reaching that goal. This is a, a graph of where emissions come from currently in the state. Uh, much of the progress that I was just showing in the previous graphs has occurred in the electricity sector. So California has made a lot of progress in reducing emissions from the different sources that produce the electricity that's, that's consumed here in California. It used to be that more coal was used, uh, much of it imported from other states. Uh, uh, there's been a big decline in that, as well as a rise in renewables in solar and wind and, and other sources that have really driven that, those declines. So it's a much smaller piece of the pie than it used to be. The largest piece of the pie um, by far is, is transportation and, and the vehicles that we drive. Buildings are a little harder to see here, but also I want to, to mention currently, if, if you think about both the uh, emissions from activities and fossil fuel burning that happens in the home, as well as the electricity that's consumed in the home and the emissions from those, they make up about a quarter of, of this pie. The direct emissions are those that you see in the commercial and residential sectors here. Um, I was, uh, in, in preparing for this, I, I was looking a little bit at some of the, the documents that have been prepared for the city of San Jose, and um, this is from the most recent inventory of, of community-wide greenhouse gas uh, emissions for the city, and I think you see a similar picture. Um, the, the largest piece of the pie is transportation. Natural gas use in, in buildings is, is next, and then also electricity um, as a, a important part of the pie as well. And I think that it's uh, something where um, I, I think it's really important to think about what are in any given location and, and any given context, what are the important um, and, and possible actions that can be taken. And, and it seems that there's a, a very good basis to build from in the city of San Jose with the Climate Smart San Jose plan that was released and adopted by the city council a few years ago. Um, this document on the right hand side is the one that I took the figure from just now. And this, uh, this plan highlights a, a range of different kinds of strategies related to um, workspace near transit, related to uh, uh, using renewable energy and electrifying both vehicles and also buildings, um, as well as thinking about uh, focused growth and reducing vehicle miles traveled um, and also water use is, is brought in as well. Uh, one of the things that this plan highlighted that I thought was important to mention and uh, that I think is true more broadly is that actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions can have many other local benefits beyond just reducing uh, the impacts of climate change, reducing energy and transportation costs for residents and businesses, creating green jobs, improving health of residents, also improving communities and then making them more uh, uh, sustainable and attractive places to live. I think looking forward and, and uh, happy to discuss this further in the question and answer, some of the things that uh, this commission might consider are and, and some of the things that the, that the city is already doing to some extent are, are evaluating progress against these goals. I think it's important to think also about evaluating the, the goals themselves for consistency with both the science and also um, consistency with state and federal goals as, as they advance. I think it's also really important to consider additional actions, particularly where local action can lead. One example, in my opinion, of that is uh, San Jose's REACH codes encouraging all electric new construction and also plans to electrify existing buildings. I also think it's important to mention that it's critical in all of this to focus on environmental and social justice and also on solutions that are equitable and inclusive. In closing, I will say that 
San Jose, in my opinion, can be an example for others to follow while also protecting its citizens from local climate impacts. And I'm going to stop there and look forward to taking your questions and continuing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Commissioner Marshman. Thank you. Um, really, really nice briefing. Um, can you give an opinion on San Jose's policies at this point, uh, where they stand? Are they uh, ahead of a lot of cities? Are they behind a lot of cities? Um, and I, you know, part of part of my thinking here is: is this something we need to somehow insert in the city charter to make it happen, or is San Jose pretty much going down this path now and may not need a structural change to do it? You know, I, I don't think that I know enough of the details to give a very detailed evaluation of how San Jose compares to other cities. Mm -hmm. My sense from what I've seen is that San Jose has taken many actions that, that other cities have not, and, and that some cities are also possibly places to look at as comparisons. Um, what, I, what I would say is, as I was mentioning at the end of my talk, I think it is important to think about we, on this, uh, as a climate scientist, we are always learning more about what the risks are and what are the things that we should both prepare for, as well as what the opportunities are to reduce emissions. And so I do think that there may be a role for uh, a, a commission or, or actions in the context of the charter to think about as information evolves and as uh, policy targets, uh, again, at the state or the federal level or in, in other municipalities evolve, um, are evaluating are those consistent with the broader mission and the broader charter of the city um, to be able to think about how those evolve over time, because it's it's easy to just sort of set a target. It's I think it's a lot more important how that actually gets implemented and to evaluate progress towards those goals. Thank you. Mr. Huaytran. Um, thank you for the presentation. Actually, Commissioner Marshman asked my question, so I actually have a follow up to that, though. Um, are you aware of any other cities or jurisdictions that have incorporated some kind of uh, structural change uh, to ensure that they are meeting climate goals or that they are uh, working towards uh, environmental reforms? I have seen a number of organizations that create you know, coalitions of cities um, that, that are working together to compare notes and to look at how they're, they're coordinating on goals and to learn from each other, those kinds of things. Um, but specifically to your question, I think there's you know, different actions that be, can be taken at different levels of government. And so, like I was talking about here in California, many of the broader emissions reduction schools have been set at the state level or, or various policies that are aimed at reducing emissions in particular sectors. In some of those sectors, there are really important uh, actions that can be taken at the local level, level at, at a city level, for example, and I think uh, buildings and building codes and, and other aspects of how we think about the energy infrastructure that goes to homes and businesses is, I think, a really good example of that. Um, and so those are places where I think there's there's direct local actions that can be taken that then have outcomes that, that go more broadly. Um, I, I would not be an expert, and I think it would be good to get input from an expert who has, thinks about the legalities of how that would feed into a, a charter conversation, but that's not my expertise. Commissioner Fuentes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for this very um, important presentation. Um, one thought I have is um, you, you probably are aware that um, when this issue with COVID began, um, um, personally, I was ex extremely grateful and impressed that um, the Bay Area Health Departments decided to work together in um, setting policy and so forth. So you're nodding your head, so you're, you're you know what I'm referring to. I'm wondering if there are any um, areas in, well, in the, in the, say in the United States, um, where that has happened. So what, what would be the difference if, for instance, our city was to do something versus really trying to quickly build toward a Bay Area response, just like we did with um, COVID? What, what do you think about that perspective? 
I, I think that's a very interesting perspective and, and worth considering. I would also say that it is my sense that some of those kinds of activities are, are already underway where there are actions, again, that can be taken specifically by individual cities and, and that affect outcomes within that city, but also that can be taken more at a regional level or at a, at a county level, say, or, or then again at a, at a state or larger level. And, and so, you know, here in the Bay Area, um, I believe that the County of Santa Clara, County of San Mateo, other counties have ac actions that they're taking on climate resilience, for instance, um, that are at more of that kind of a level and, and also the broader range of counties uh, that make up the Bay Area more, more at a regional level at that point. Um, again, I think what I, what I would say is that it sounds like what is most um, important here is to think about what can be done you know, within the city, but also that could involve, that could include um, uh, taking actions that would involve the city in, in broader actions. And I think both of those things are important to consider. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. I echo the thanks for the presentation. Um, really great opportunity to, to receive this summary of the data in this setting and <clears throat> apologize for being off camera and having some internet issues. Um, you touched briefly at the very end about uh, on the intersection between um, the climate issues and um, social and environmental justice. And since this commission um, uh, has sort of stated equity as a centerpiece of our commitments, I was wondering if, if you might um, take a bit to just expand a little bit more on, on what those uh, intersections are, particularly with uh, economic, racial, and, and gender equity, I think being the three dimensions that we called out. Thank you for the question. And I think it's a really important one. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit more about that. I think the first thing I'll say is that when thinking about any kinds of solutions from a climate standpoint, they are, inseparable from other aspects of how our society works, where we get energy, how the, the impacts of, of um, uh, both climate impacts as well as other aspects of our society are differential across uh, different populations and, and different uh, parts of our communities. And so I think in terms of thinking about solutions, the solutions also have to really be centered in thinking about what are the effects and also who is included in making those kinds of decisions. Um, we work with with some of the organizations uh, here in the state that, that work on environmental and environmental justice issues. Primarily, the work that I do is involved thinking about those issues at, at, at a statewide level and for the, the statewide policies that are being considered. Um, I think it's it's really critical to think about in any context where are the areas where there may be the the most impacts that are already being felt or that are expected in the future and how to think about preparing for those, but also to think about if there are policies that are being implemented or other actions that are being taken to reduce emissions, that the benefits of those uh, those policies and, and actions are also something that are um, spread equitably uh, to, to all parts of the, of the population and also that uh, would address areas where there have been, you know, uh, prior racism, prior um, uh, uh, inequalities that have been uh, entrenched in past decades. And so I guess in closing, I would say that I think that these issues and another reason why it's relevant to think about in this kind of a commission is that climate isn't something that you can just sort of take off on its own and, and think about um, and come up with solutions that only focus on that. It really needs to be thought of as of how are we thinking about our societies going forward? How are we thinking about our communities and, and how they're structured? Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I just have a few questions. Um, what does beyond reach mean if we don't stay below the threshold? Then I'll pick up with the last two questions. What that is referring to in the IPCC uh, conclusion that I, that I showed earlier is really that it, in these scenarios and looking at what emissions of greenhouse gases might do in the future, in the scenarios that do not have significant and essentially immediate emissions reductions, temperature increase continues and passes those temperature thresholds that, that we were talking about. And once temperature increases, um, it's, it, it takes 
quite a long time for the climate system to you know kind of turn and, and move in different directions. There's a lot of inertia in the system. And so the um, irreversibility of those changes is something that, that they would be with us for quite a while if we cross those thresholds. That's I think what is what the beyond reach is referring to. Okay, and what are some of the things that can happen? Right. Well, I would say that it depends, you know, uh, which part of the world you're talking about here in, in the in in the the Bay Area. I guess I think that the 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 most um, important impacts that come to my mind are um, all of the changes in extremes and what what scientists would call climate extremes that that I uh, gave a few examples of. Those include more frequent and more intense heat waves. All of the interactions with um, both heavy storms and also drought conditions that, that I talked about a little bit, as well as drier conditions, uh, creating longer and much more intense fire seasons that then have a variety of, of other impacts, uh, smoke uh, on public health, for example. Um, those, I think, are, are some of the things where um, those changes, where you can have small changes in average conditions leading to larger changes in the extremes around them, are things that I would worry about um, uh, first. I think there's also longer term changes that, as I was mentioning, can really be irreversible on, on timeframes that are important to humans. And those are things like uh, the sea level rise impacts that I talked about as an example, and just broader um, warmer temperature impacts, where those are things that once they happen, it's, it's hard to reverse them on, I, for many decades. And so again, you know, speaks, I think, to the urgency of both slowing things down, but also to really um, understanding how we, we avoid those, those worst impacts that would come if we don't take action. Thank you. Um, have you, do other cities have um, commissions on climate? And, you know, like, for example, in San Jose, we have a library commission, we have all kinds of boards and commissions. Um, do other cities have commissions on climates? And if, if we were to recommend a um, commission on climate in San Jose, what kind of things would it look at? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I, again, I think it would be useful to, to speak to an expert who looks at, you know, the legal structures around these kinds of things, the, the climate smart plan that, that San Jose has released and, and governance around that, I think is a good starting point to, to look at for San Jose specifically. Um, however, I think that it's, it is important <laughs> to look at, you know, both what are the goals that are being set and whether those are consistent with the, the actions that uh, the science suggests and that uh, are also being taken at other levels, state and federal levels. And then also what are the um, uh, progress, what progress is being made towards those goals? Are we on track? If we're not, what else do we need to be doing? Those are some of the kinds of things that I think that kind of a commission you know, might look at. Thank you. And my final question has to do with um, reporting emissions reporting climate mitigation um, and climate impact. How could a city like San Jose report its climate impact and mitigation? What, what would that even look like? The, so at both the international and the national and state level, there are greenhouse gas inventories that look at emissions in different sectors and different categories of emissions and then um, create a, a tabulation of all of those kinds of things. Uh, in, in looking at the Climate Smart Plan, uh, I, I showed a picture of this. It looks like there is already quite a bit of work being done at the city of San Jose um, to create an inventory. The most recent data is available for the year 2019, which is consistent with the latest data available at the state level currently. Um, those, so I, one of the other functions, I didn't speak about this today, but one of the other functions that IPCC uh, holds at the international level is to create standards for how you do these kinds of greenhouse gas inventories that have then been adopted by the US Environmental Protection Agency, the State Air Resources Board. Um, and I would imagine that the, the procedures that the city of San Jose is, is following have uh, some consistency with those other kinds of standards. Um, Really, I think what it comes down to is a question of, are you including all of the different sources of emissions? Are you able to then track progress in those different categories uh, towards the goals that you would like to set, those kinds of things. And Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Fuentes, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, my question has to do with um, 
um, examples of um, fast track strategies. I mean, in other words, this is a huge, you know, really serious crisis we're in. Um, can you give us any examples of whatever it is, whether it's cities or countries who really have decided something major, you know, to address this, some, some you know, a radical change that um, they've, they've thought of to implement and be able to impact this crisis? Thank you for the question. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind in response to that is that often these kinds of transitions can happen more quickly than, than people might realize once they have been set in motion. Um, and I think that you see examples of that here in the US already around renewable energy expansion, uh, EVs, where, where electric vehicles, excuse me, where some in some of these sectors, I think there's new technologies that are becoming available that where the, the costs are not only becoming competitive, but also the features of those uh, types of, of technologies are things that are appealing to people and, and, and also provide benefits in, in ways that um, haven't been available before. And so I think you can see examples where policy can be kind of a push towards a transition, but then it, you know, gains momentum and, and takes on steam and, and continues and accelerates for other reasons. Um, I think here, you know, another theme to think about is that there are some of our kinds of activities and some of our energy infrastructure that is very uh, uh, greenhouse gas intensive is, is, is using fossil fuels. Uh, one example of that would be, you know, the natural gas infrastructure that serves our, our buildings. And so there's really important, you know, uh, safety and maintenance uh, uh, responsibilities that, that need to be maintained with those kinds of infrastructure. But I think there's also uh, uh, questions to ask about how do we think about that infrastructure in the future? Do we continue to add to it? Do we think about a different path for it? Do we think about you know, replacing uh, natural gas appliances with with electric appliances, and how does that also get get paid for? Given you know potentially some of the affordability and equity dimensions that we were talking about earlier, those I think are some of the transitions and the potential barriers to transitions that need to be overcome. If you think about the the pathways I talked about before, and those are places where I think uh, you know, city government and a commission like this could potentially play a role. Thank you, Commissioner Monley. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the city of San Jose has banned new con um, the use of gas-powered appliances in all new construction, and they've done this along with Berkeley and Oakland. And uh, just recently, Menlo Park considered um, uh, going a step further, and that is to retrofit every uh, business and residence in the city with electric only. Uh, it looks like they are backtracking a little bit on that to, um, in order to do a pilot program of some kind. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it seemed very popular with the city, but uh, with residents in the city, but um, uh, it looks like in reality, it may not be such a doable uh, project by 2030. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you for that question. This is a, a, a topic that we've done some research on at, at Stanford and looked into various policy mechanisms that are, are on the table and are being discussed right now. My, my opinion is that, first of all, I think that the reach codes and the, the uh, actions that are targeting new construction are really important and are, are similar to what we were just talking about of not continuing mm -hmm. to add infrastructure that will, will make the problem worse. Um, but as we all know, we don't build that many houses in, in California, and that the, that new construction is really a small percentage of the overall uh, homes and businesses that, that we all live in and use. And, and so I think that there it is important to consider actions that are um, helping to transition the existing buildings, both the both res residential, commercial, and, and, and other parts of the system. And that's where, you know, I, I don't think there's one right answer of how quickly to do that, but I don't think that just waiting till those homes are naturally retrofitted or torn down and new construction comes in to replace it. I, I don't think that will happen uh, at a pace that is consistent with the kinds of timeframes we're talking about um, of, of addressing climate change and, and the, the risks of, of, of taking those actions. Um, yeah. So that means I think that, that it is really important to think of those things as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Seeing no other questions from commissioners, I want to thank our speaker um, for being here with us tonight and thank the subcommittee for the invitation. Really appreciate your thoughtful presentation. And um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Kat Woodmancy, who is an MS in biology and systems ecologist from Chico State University. Uh, welcome to the commission and thank you for coming tonight. Sound check. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for the invitation for having me. Um, I was asked to speak to how we might modify the charter with language that will address the issues that you've just heard something of uh, on the local level. So um, I uh, made a stab at this. Uh, I'm again, I'm a biologist and a, you know, an engineer. I don't really consider myself a policy wonk. So some of this seems, uh, you know, naive or uh, impossible. Um, you can just chalk it up to ineptitude, and I will definitely wear that. Um, so I have prepared comments here. I'm just going to I'm just going to read this. It should be about 20 minutes, I think. I'm not off by too much. And then we can take questions if you have any. Okay, so global heating and the associated changes in the regional climate together create a global issue. We cannot say yet if there will be a global solution. However, we do know with certainty that any harms will be of a local nature. We are already seeing signs of what we can expect from the future in the horrifying record-breaking fires, floods, freezes, droughts, cyclones, and the accelerating breakdown of previously stable parts of the whole Earth system. The most recent IPCC report suggests we can expect 30 more years, at least, of increasingly worse outcomes, with each year potentially breaking records set just the year before. It seems we find ourselves now at a crossroads, where every step forward takes us further off a map defined by 8,000 years of Earth system's stability. Beyond here, there will be monsters. People are going to suffer in large numbers due to changes in the climate. People are going to die. It is time we accept the challenge to save the people, all the people, but starting with the people in our fair city. The political class certainly understands the challenge, but perceived political expedience prevents timely, realistic actions in response. For the moment, it seems the political class cannot save the people. The financial and business classes also understand the challenge, but apart from the insurance sector, they cannot generally consider threats any further out than the next quarterly results. The insurance sector in particular has seen the future of climate impacts and is canceling policies. Obviously, this, is not, this will not save the people either. It appears the people must now endeavor to save themselves. The purpose of a city is to serve the needs of people. The laws and regulations of the city are created with the intent to provide a civilized experience for all. Today, we consider amendments to the charter of the city of San Jose, to add language that will inform the city's response to a looming global climate crisis so as to save the people and in so doing, preserve civilization. Permit me now to outline what such charter language should contain. Consider an approach like a stool with three legs. In our case, one leg is data collection concerning carbon emissions and fossil fuel consumption for the sake of transparency and decision-making. Another leg is identifying communities in harm's way and ensuring they become resilient to climate disasters where resilience is lacking, focusing in particular on historically underserved communities. And the third leg is the creation of a commission of the people to ensure that the political and business elites understand the importance of saving the people. I will now provide some details on how this could work, starting with the first leg, data collection. The charter should be amended with language to require city departments and services to analyze and report their current and projected annual fossil fuel consumption and other sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and to report how they're mitigating these emissions, if at all, and if not, how they might reduce them or mitigate, and if they cannot, why they cannot. The exact same requirement would apply to private enterprises operating inside the city or providing goods or services to the city. 
The charter should also require analyzing the fossil fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions of citizens in aggregate. For example, how often and where citizens drive, commute patterns into and out of the city, adoption rates for electric vehicles, bicycles, and mass transit, mass transit passenger mile carbon emissions, the expansion of suburbs, freeway passenger miles, densification of the urban core, the pace and locations of new home construction, and the like. It is potentially a long list. The actual measures would also evolve over time as the charter must specify the need for this data as an aid to planning and not the exact kinds of data. Data collection of citizen emission patterns could be via surveys and or longitudinal studies and should be completely anonymized. As described above, the first leg of our approach would be to be used to identify areas where the city and local businesses could and likely should reduce fossil fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. A first step toward paring down our contribution to the problem. The actual numerical goals for this work, meaning the targets of re for reductions, might come to the city via state law or federal law or even international treaty. But there is nothing to stop the city from having more aggressive goals, either for itself, the citizens, or the business community. Where multiple goals for reductions exist at different levels of governance, including international agreements, or via different jurisdictions, the city will take on the more aggressive targets. The ultimate target for fossil fuels consumption by the city, citizens, and businesses within the city is taken to be numerically zero, meaning no consumption of any kind. Likewise, the ultimate goal of carbon emissions is taken as zero. These are difficult goals to be sure and will be deemed politically unpalatable or in other ways impossible, but like it or not, these are the real goals of the work being described here, even if lesser, more acceptable targets are pursued instead. But reducing fossil fuel reliance is not just about doing with less for the sake of less. It can be viewed as a strategic defensive measure where reducing reliance can forestall serious local economic damage in the event that national or state climate actions require us to take on a sudden, forced, and dramatic reduction in fossil fuel and energy consumption. The sooner the city, the citizens, and businesses can operate without significant reliance on fossil fuel consumption, then the least harm will be felt when energy supplies become deliberately curtailed or the price of fuels enter the stratosphere. These are trends we can anticipate as global heating begins to bite and national governments take concerted draconian steps to save the human world from disaster. The second leg of our approach is to create resilient communities. All communities of the city will be impacted by global heating. No neighborhood or zip code can escape this. Extreme heat events, water usage curtailments, large area flooding, strategic power cutoffs and restrictions, food disruptions and civil unrest are on the short list of what we can realistically expect at some point. These will affect all the people of the city at one time or another, and probably everyone at once in particular cases. Some neighborhoods will suffer weeks of disruption and multiple threats at the same time, like large area excessive heat coupled with regional power interruptions and resulting food shortages. Threats from global heating will generally impact large areas of the city, overwhelming emergency services, dislocating people by the thousands and resulting in potential mass casualty events that overwhelm first responders, hospitals, and morgues. Creating resilient communities is hard work. It's politically unpopular and it can be difficult to quantify success. Charter language that requires resilience must specify resilient outcomes based on models of expected harm. For example, identifying the requirement to provide cooling centers to neighborhoods against the expect expectation of weeks long extreme heat events. It would fall to city planners to then figure out how cooling centers are to be made available, how and when people can be notified to seek shelter and how shelters will be kept working in the event of power curtailments. Where cooling centers do not exist, how they should be created and operated and how to pay for this, how far a citizen can be expected to travel in safety and by what means to get to a shelter, how they will be fed while at the shelter and for how long this can be expected to go on. All of that is just cooling centers and just for extreme heat events. But this is what it takes to save the people if saving the people is indeed what we intend. 
It is extremely important to recognize the historic trend to sidestep the needs of certain communities in city planning. A practice creates, that creates an unnecessary island of vulnerability and to make sure this practice does not continue into an era of climate-driven catastrophes. Poor, underrepresented, and underserved people are in no position to go it alone in the struggle against global heating and climate change impacts. They will need help, education, and services where these are lacking or are not suitable to purpose. As the city rolls out resilience measures into communities, whatever those turn out to be, the measures must be distributed in the most equitable way possible as a moral imperative. The charter language should require the identification of all vulnerable communities, the exact nature of their vulnerabilities, which will be multiple, and then direct city planners and leaders to ensure these communities are not left to suffer and perish. All communities will need support during a regional or citywide climate-driven calamity. The scope of this ch challenge could at times be absolutely massive, but the more the city can get out in front of the problem, starting with the most vulnerable among us, the better will be the outcomes. This simply cannot be overstated. Again, it is a matter of the highest moral imperative that we do this right. So that is the second leg of our approach to saving the people, creating resilience, is a daunting task, one fraught with political landmines, budget busting expenses, class struggle, festering grievances, and everything else that comes with societal change on a massive scale. But juggling all that is the challenge before us, now and into the future. If you intend to keep your civilization, then that is how you keep your civilization. The third leg of our approach is to create what I will call here a climate crisis commission, C3 for short, or for conversation, the commission. The C3 will be the interface between the people who sense their own growing and present vulnerability to climate changes and the political and business classes, which are at present apparently not as concerned. Because of this mismatching goals, I feel compelled to state from the outset that what the commission is not. This is not another political playground. This is not a business roundtable. It is not an academic sideshow. It is not a place to discuss economic growth, jobs, innovation, or anything related, even if more jobs and innovation are seen as a good thing for an underserved community. The C3 scope of work is here expressly directed away from economic, political, or budgetary considerations. If that appears harsh, unrealistic, or arbitrary, it is actually none of those. It is an honest assessment of what it will take to save people from destruction. We can have our politics, economics, and budget back after we have saved the people. I should hope this is obvious. If it is not obvious, then we need to take a collective moment to realign our moral compass. Put simply, the C3, indeed, the entire charter amendment language outlined here, all are expressly constructed to preserve the lives and livelihoods of the most number of people possible in the very teeth of the greatest threat to survival the human project has seen in probably 70,000 years. Now to the structure of the C3 itself. As this is the gravitational center of the work I'm identifying, I spend more time on this component than the others. I think the commission represents the most challenging to implement and its proper working, the best chance for total success. The commission will be grounded in the work of two communities that need to inform our climate crisis response. The community of scientists acting in an advisory capacity and the non-science public who need a specific understanding of how climate challenges will impact their communities so they can respond respond to preserve themselves. The charter language here should specify the C3 be created by the city and funded to the extent required for its given purpose, being data collection, analysis, outreach, and internal operations required for regular meetings. The C3 will not implement policy or direct city budgets, but will, by regular reports, inform the city council of the challenges people are facing and will face in the future and recommend mitigations and projects the C3 will submit record reports from meetings to the city council and into the public record on a regular basis. The C3 should have some representation at council meetings to answer questions or provide critical updates. The C3 will meet at a location and time determined by C3 participants or else via remote technology as agreed or required. Either the location or the time can be can change from meeting to meeting or be static. Meetings must be held within the city of San Jose 
in either public or private venue with a budget provided for any site specific expenses. But, but the best solution is to hold meetings via remote technology, if at all possible. The C3 will consist of a citizens panel and a science panel. The latter acting in a specific advisory capacity with a commission chair selected in rotation. As the city currently consists of 10 districts, there will be that many citizen panel caucuses on the C3, each caucus consisting of two voting district citizen representatives and one or more non-voting alternates. The initial participants in the C3 will be selected by serving city council members who will submit their recommendations for the citizen panel, selected using whatever recruit process the council member deems suitable provided that each citizen panelist will submit into the public record a written statement describing their background, the nature of their interest in the work of the C3, acceptance of the consensus science concerning global heating and climate change, and an expressed agreement to support the mission of the C3 to save the people. Citizen panelists will serve on the C3 for no more than a year, but can return to serve again after the lapse of a year. They can resign at will, to be replaced by an alternate. After the initial selection of C3 citizen panelists, new members will be brought forward by the district caucus along with their written letter as described above. The applicant's inclusion to be subject to a majority 51% vote of the rest of the combined panels of the C3. A non-voting commission chair will be selected from the current rotation district caucus by that caucus, reducing their vote by one to serve as chair for one meeting of the commission. The position of chair will rotate in a round robin fashion through all the districts changing for each meeting. And the chair will be announced by the next district in rotation in advance of the meetings as part of the next agenda. The chair of the first meeting of the C3 will be taken from district one with rotation into other districts after that. The science panel will consist of at least three participants granted voting rights on the commission matters and having the necessary skills and expertise to address the complex nature of climate science, having knowledge of specific reporting, such as that issued by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and understanding how climate impacts will intersect with local concerns, such as the emergency provision and continuity of water supply, food supply, electrical power, and transportation. The science panel can be drawn from the academic community, local citizenry, out of town experts or city staff. This list not being exhaustive at all. The sole requirement for inclusion in the science panel is that the participant expressly and in writing accepts the consensus science regarding global heating and climate change, has an understanding of known and expected threats to human welfare, can speak to mitigation strategies regarding climate threats and supports the aim of saving the people of the city as a first priority. Potential participants will signify their interest in sitting on the panel by submitting into the public record a written statement of intent addressing the above point and further describing their areas of expertise, experiences in the field as they might apply to the aims of the commission and an acceptance of the three C3 mission to save the people from disruption and mortality caused by climate changes. Anyone submitting the desired profile can sit on the science panel at any time and provide advice but only three can be designated to vote on commission work. There is no district level caucus or exact limit to the number of participants from the science community, but there is a charter requirement that three voting science panelists be present during commission meetings with at least one non-voting alternate to fill any unforeseen gaps in attendance. The science panel informs the citizens panel and thus all the people concerning their most likely future under climate change to the best extent this can be known at any given time so that the citizens panel can in aggregate plot their course towards a comprehensive and equitable resilience for the people. The citizens panel once formed will be tasked with seating the science panel and designating the three voting participants based on submitted letters of interest from potential participants in the scientific and technical communities. A simple majority 51% vote of acceptance from the citizens panel will suffice for this. The citizens panel and the science panel voting members vote as equals on all matters before the C3, except for those matters already designated to district caucuses. Matters before the commission will be passed with a majority 51% vote. 
The C3 will meet on a cadence to be determined by the C3 in session, meaning the C3 will be in a position to dynamically address the urgency of the work or the complexity of the challenges to be taken on as the commission itself sees these. The me next meeting agenda work of the C3 will be determined at the end of the given meeting as will the rotating chair, as will the location and time of the next meeting if this is allowed to change. Any item can be added to the next meeting agenda and the entire agenda and chair will be accepted by the current meeting assembly by a majority vote. The C3 will be the audience for the data reporting mentioned as the first leg of the chapter language, charter language. The citizens and scientists together will determine the suitability for purpose of the reporting or any needed clarification will determine if and how to publish the reporting for the benefit of the larger community and will pass the reporting with comments and recommendations for action to the city council when it is deemed complete, not less than once per year. The commission is otherwise free to determine what else will constitute their work. Where that work requires funding, the commission will need to approach either private funding sources or the city. At the very least, C3 work will likely consist of work such as, and I have nine points here, by no means exhaustive. One, identify the most likely climate threats to afflict the people of the city of San Jose. This should include direct threats such as flood, fire and heat, as well as indirect threats such as water curtailments, power outages, and food supply interruptions. The list almost writes itself, but how these threats play out against the city will be harder to determine. Two, create a process to identify non-overlapping culturally distinct communities. If there are such, consisting of no fewer than 5,000 5, citizens each, publish a written description of these communities and their distinct and defining cultural attributes as well as their unique and defining requirements to survive as a distinct culture during a crisis. These cultural communities may have to be, may have a recognized neighborhood structure or not. Three, commission work will identify the boundary extent of underserved communities, whether cultural distinct or not. This can be broadly defined. It need not be an actual map of streets and intersections at the same time and working with community representatives determine what the community will require to endure the kinds of previously defined climate impacts. Four, commission work to identify where described communities lack basic services critical, critical to surviving climate change impacts, where these emissions represent a threat to community integrity and how to mitigate that threat. Mitigations can span multiple communities, but must be large enough to adequately serve a significant part of communities that need mitigation. This work will be submitted annually to the City Council. The Commission will identify best climate mitigation and defensive practices for anticipated climate impacts as these have been developed in other cities and regions and describe how these might be incorporated into the effort to increase resilience among citizens of the city. Six, identify goals for fossil fuel consumption reduction targets and for carbon emission reduction targets using the best science and technological solutions that apply. This can be done for individual city departments or services where reduction seems most warranted. For example, in first responders who are ultimately the most vulnerable to fuel shortages or restrictions or fuel cost increases. Seven, report annually to council the state of the climate science and the state of knowledge of how climate changes are expected to harm, uh, to cause harm to the city and the citizens and businesses. Report instances of impacts having occurred in the city and how these might have been caused by global heating or climate changes. Academic rigor is not the goal. A simple statement recognizing impacting events and how these tie into the work of the commission is sufficient. Eight, work to develop resilience definitions around how, around known impact vectors such as extreme heat, floods, food crises, water disruptions and the like will produce resilience across the city. Catalog what would be required in the best case to protect the most number of people and vulnerable communities from undue harm or excessive mortality. And nine, perform climate crisis modeling and response. This needs not be an academically or scientifically rigorous approach. It could instead be a set of narrative scenarios focusing on likely single or combined impacting events across a few or many communities with supporting data drawn from real world disasters in similar situations as what exists in San Jose. 
to be published as completed to the city council with recommendations, if any recommendations make sense. So that is a good start on a list of work for the C3. No doubt a much longer list could be developed as a discovery process unwinds and unseen vulnerabilities and solutions alike come to the surface. And those are the three legs of an approach to how the city of San Jose might be instructed via the charter to accept the challenges of saving the people. Data collection, identifying vulnerable communities and likely impacts and forming a commission to represent the goal of the people to save themselves from massive dislocations, suffering and mortality. The recommendations here are not meant to be dystopian or punitive. No particular business, civic city service or class of people are called out or targeted for blame since doing so would not provoke survival. The purpose is simply to accept the challenge and then to set aside egos and grievances and past practices and venture as a unified community of people into that unknown future dynamic planetary system where lay the monsters, where the Earth's own global engines are already set in grinding motion against us, against all of us. We will none of us flourish alone in the struggle, but we may just make it to the end with most of our institutions, our precious cultures, our neighborhoods, and our civilization intact. And this is to wish us all good luck. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Commissioner's questions? Commissioner Siegel. Thank you, Mr. Woodmancy. I just wanted to sincerely thank you for um, coming here today to speak to us. It was very impressive, the detail that you gave, the local detail for our city of San Jose. Um, this year, Europe reached 120 degrees, which was really unprecedented. Have you read any data um, that would lead you to believe San Jose would reach 120? And do you have any idea or have you read any science or scientific models that would perhaps tell us when that would be? Yeah, um, there are there are global system models that have us, our region of the lower 48, designated as a likely area for extended drought. Uh, extended drought does not necessarily mean excessive heat, but uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow that we're not going to have that. So, uh, but a little closer to home, and I'm, I'm sure you remember this, um, here in our own Northwest, Oregon, Washington, and uh, British Columbia, we had a massive, excessive, uh, gobsmacking, uh, excessive heat event. And I, I, that's not very far away from us. Uh, if that had hit us, uh, we would have been badly burned. Uh, scientists at the time said of that event that it is, it would, at that event would have been considered impossible. And I heard someone say something that chills me to the bone to this, even to now, which is that the events in, in Oregon, the 116 degrees they had in I don't know, Portland or somewhere or Vancouver, uh, actually pushes, pushes back the, 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 the order of what is possible. Now that may not mean much as stated, but when scientists say that, that they're off the map, that they actually don't know what's possible now, then, then you, you, need, you need to sit up and take notice. Scientists don't talk like that. They don't talk about, oh, we're off the map folks. We don't even know what's possible anymore. Uh, if, 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 things, if things like that came to our neighborhood and, and we're not that far away from there, uh, I, I, I don't even want to. I don't even want to consider. I don't even want to think about it. it. It's terrifying. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner Matsumura? Yes. Um, thank you. Also to you for for the the presentation and <clears throat> as Commissioner Siegel said, sort of the local specificity and and detail with which you've thought these things through. Um, I'm wondering in particular for for really for um, 
actually all three legs of, of the stool as you laid them out. Uh, well, okay, two part question. <laughs> um, how those compare with what the city is currently has in place by way of, um, of policy and practice, right? So I'm trying to understand what it exists or is sort of on track to exist given existing policy and practice, but you're saying needs to be codified into the charter versus what you're saying it would be new policy or practice with the charter as the tool to create that. Uh, yeah, so that's my first question. Okay, then let me tackle that first one. Um, uh, I am not intimately tied into the, the city operations. I, I, am, I am literally a citizen scientist, okay? Um, and uh, I know that the city has adopted a uh, declaration of climate emergency uh, along with the, you know, the state and uh, has, as previously mentioned, the, the state is, is uh, state, the city are trying to wean people off of fossil fuels and uh, in their homes, the natural gas, and also to encourage uh, the, the, the uh, installation of solar panels. The city has uh, gone some of the distance by offering their, um, their uh, energy mix, uh, you know, where you can subscribe to the to through pg e you can subscribe to a special green energy mix for your home. Uh, you know, pay a certain fee, maybe pay more if you want 100% uh, renewables and those kinds of things. I think these are all steps in the right direction. Uh, the city has adopted a um, uh, you know a fairly substantial bike policy of really encouraging the creation of bike lanes and the utilization of bike lanes, uh, lots of traffic calming. These are all really important, uh, I would say, staging steps. These are not, I, I don't know of any steps directed exactly at climate change impacts as these would be anticipated. For example, I don't think the city has any uh, organized stand on how to handle excessive heat events which will almost certainly happen, maybe even multiple times a year once they, once they start. So uh, I, I think even if they have these things, even if they have programs and projects, uh, one of the things that the commission is going to have to do after identifying the existence of these things is, is just verify that they are being worked into all the communities equally and equitably. Uh, I won't even say equally, because uh, equitably may actually require you to go to extra lengths to, to do that. Uh, after centuries, decades, centuries of neglect, you may have to do unequal implementations of some of these things and go all out in these communities. So uh, it, you know, is, the city, is the city doing this piecemeal? Is it highly organized? Do we have any reporting and visibility into this? Do the communities even know that they're being targeted? For mitigations, uh, do they do they even care? Do they know why they're going to be getting these services? Do they know how to use them? Uh, these are all unknowns, uh, I'm sure. And it, it, there has to be a concerted <clears throat> and organized uh, effort at the city level to to just validate that we're yeah okay we're doing something, but are we doing really uh, the work? Are we doing the work? Or, you know, for everybody. Commissioner Brasco. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodmancy, for presenting to us. Um, you may have mentioned this in your presentation, but would you be able to highlight some cities that, that have kicked off some of the recommendations that you're proposing um, for us to do some, some research on? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I didn't, I didn't do quite enough homework um, to answer that question. Uh, There are going to be best practices. There are going to be things that cities had the political foresight to do that maybe we can't or wouldn't, that simply don't apply. Um, for, for me to even go out into cities and say, oh, look, here's something cute. Oh, look, that sounds interesting. Um, would kind of overlook the purpose of the commission, which is 
uh, where the commission starts not with, oh, here's a fun thing to do. Oh, look what they're doing. We can do that too, can't we? Uh, but instead, to start with community, start with needs, identify gaps, identify vulnerabilities, and, and from there, uh, work, work from there. So I would actually not counsel going out I immediately and identifying all the all the gigas that people are doing who have more money or they have more political support, they have, you know, a more enlightened city council, whatever, and, and start at home. We have to start at home. We have to start at home. Our challenges are local. We don't even know what they are. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody, there's activists out there and lobbyists and whatnot who can say, oh, wow, if you want challenges, hey, sit down. I got a list for you. And we'd like to hear from those people. And from that, we may find that Actually, we don't need gigas and whiz bang or anything. We need electric buses. We need cooling centers. We need uh, public phones. I mean, it, it, it could be a, a list of basic, frankly, stupid things. I mean, why don't we have these things? We don't have these things. Why don't we? Okay. So I would advocate starting from the ground up. And then as, uh, as, as we start to understand our challenges here locally, then venture out and, and, and see what solutions uh, other people have applied to similar or identical uh, challenges. That that would be my data-driven approach, right? Scientist here, got my science hat on, being data-driven. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Metzke, sorry, Commissioner Metzler, I did not get to your second question. I'll get to it right next. Uh, Commissioner Metzke. Uh, yes, thank you. I want to thank both of the speakers, especially um, Mr. Woodmancy. I really appreciate your focus on the adaptation piece and like what are the threats and maybe how should we address them? Because a lot of times when we get into this topic, everybody likes to talk about being carbon neutral and those kinds of things. But I think the most important thing is what do we do about it? Because it is going to impact us. Uh, Mike, Mike, I have a comment and it's more towards the, the, the committee more than the actual speaker. Um, I think is that a very important topic, um, but I'm still personally struggling with why it needs to be in the charter. It seems like a very important policy issue. So I think when the when the committee goes back, I think it'd be good to come back with some information to answer that particular question. When I look at the commissions that are listed in the charter, they seem to be, I could be wrong, but they seem to be the ones that help our, what, how, how does the bureaucracy work? It's those kinds of commissions and everything else on terms of a policy issue seems to be a separate commission outside the charter. So if, if you don't, at least for me, I'd appreciate if you would really focus on that, that issue. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Matsumura, and then Commissioner Marshman. I'd like to let Commissioner Marshman go first, if that's okay. Thank you, Commissioner Marshman. Thank you. I actually just wanted to, to second what Frank said. I mean, I, I don't question that we need to do way more, but I, I think adding another uh, detailed uh, requirement for a city commission into the charter is, is not a good idea. And um, I, I would not support that, but I think tackling the issue more seriously is something the city should do and can do without the charter change. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, regarding the proposal for a commission, um, I'm, I'm curious sort of what you saw as the pros and cons of locating these functions within a, a commission versus uh, within an office or department of the city. So, you know, appointed officials versus staff versus, you know, I mean, even some combination of um, staff and a city council committee, you know, if there were particular reasons for the commission as the format per se, and also if you saw any downsides to that, even if you ultimately felt that the upsides uh, outweighed the downsides. Of course. Um, so that question allows me to answer the previous two comments by commissioners about <clears throat> why do we need to edit the charter to reflect this commission. And your question was, is there a better way to do this? So I'm going to answer, uh, I, I'm going to answer all those questions, including the last one, by saying that I, uh, I'm not a policy wonk. And I think this allows me 
I mean, not that you people are, and I'm not saying that in a despairing way, okay? I'm just saying that that's not how I self-identify. <laughs> so it, it allows me to take a, a higher altitude look at our challenge and intersect that with how we do things. And when I was uh, probed or, or at one point and asked if I had any thoughts about the commission and, and how that worked into the, into the charter language, um, it took me about a half a second to understand how that actually worked. It was so immediate to me within a half a second of considering the question, it was like, oh yeah, sit down, here, here it comes, okay? Here's the problem. Uh, and I alluded to this in my opening statements, climate change is global. Therefore, on some, on some bizarre parallel universe, it's nobody's problem. Okay, this especially applies to, and you know, I, I, I say this lovingly. Okay, this this not being anyone's problem applies in particular to the political class. This the climate change and global heating are going to require deep, abiding, long-term societal and personal changes that are political kryptonite. Now, the reason to put this wording into the charter is that it comes in a decision process exactly ahead of politics. It's like the Constitution of the United States it comes ahead of politics. It, 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 we would like for it to inform politics. Maybe no one ever reads the Constitution. No one ever reads the charter. Nobody cares, but it's there. And if it's there, then at some point in the future, if the political process is absolutely broken, if the people we elect to do this are just not individually or collectively capable of doing it, and they refuse and they drop the ball and they walk away, they're disgusted and they're alarmed, somebody in the community, some aspiring politician, some lobbyist, some activist could say, you cannot walk away because it's not something you voted on that you can ignore. It's not even a, a state mandate that you can ignore. It's in your city charter. It's right there. Now, if the politicians read the city charter and they say, okay, guys, we've got to do this, then no one ever has to come along and say, thou shalt. But if they don't look at it and they don't care and they're terrified and they're overwhelmed and there's only 10 of them and a mayor and they don't know what to do and they don't have time, Somebody can come along and say, thou shalt. Oh, and by the way, there's an entire commission framework to help you do this. An entire framework to help you to do this thing. And that, I think, is why it has to be in the charter. Because it has to come into play ahead of personal politics. And it has to be there as a as a as a as a, a, a pole star, as a pole star to navigate us in the right direction at all times, whatever else is going on. Somebody can say, hey, wait a second. You just made a decision. You forgot that we have a responsibility right here. I got the charter from me. I'm going to flip through some pages. Let me to read this into the public record. Thou shalt do the following. Okay. So when I was asked, is, is there any reason to have this in the charter? I said, Sit down, here it comes. And it's obvious to me as a scientist, a data-driven person, that we are not going to tackle this unless at the local level, maybe even the state level, the county level, the federal level, <clears throat> there is a lodestar, a guiding polar, polar star to say, this is the direction you can go and this is how you might be able to get there. We okay, don't Mr. have time to figure this out. Mr. Webansi, I want to, I have a few other question commissioners. I want to be able to get to everybody. So uh, appreciate your thoughts. Um, Commissioner Percival. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Webansi, for your, for your, um, all your knowledge and your, your passion about this, this topic. Um, I, just, I, just, I guess I just want to come at this a little bit at a slightly different way. And that is, can you, can you think of something, um, 
you know, I guess I, I guess I'm a little skeptical about our ability to draft, um, you know, something in the charter that uh, doesn't also run the risk of creating more problems than it does good. In the sense that I, I agree with you that the sort of putting this something like this in the charter does provide the incentive to keep focused on this really important issue, but I guess. Uh, does that also run the risk of sort of language that could be misconstrued and used to actually slow the city's progress along these lines? So one example would be, uh, you know, like CEQA, for example, you know, the California Environmental Quality Act, which was clearly designed to protect the environment, but now today is often used to, to sort of undermine uh, environmental progress. Um, or you know, smart development, or these things like things like that. So it's used for a purpose that it wasn't originally intended for. So I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, as a commission who are not experts on this issue, how we might think about some unintended consequences that might come with our actions. Um, well, there's always a risk in citizen commissions, <clears throat> the French Revolution comes to mind. I think that the way you avoid scope creep into uh, bad behavior is you have, first of all, a, a limited a charter. A, 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 the commission would have a charter. It would have its own charter. The city has a charter. The commission would have a charter. And you would have to limit their their playground. And also, by having a commission that is made up of both citizens and scientists, you kind of get a left brain right brain balance, for you know, away from getting all spun out on emotions versus all spun out on climate change data and things like that. I think by combining the two which you can well imagine is how humans have really progressed anytime we made progress, right? For 10,000 years, it was people living their lives, but it was also this small group of people who could see a little further, okay? And brought everybody with them. And, you know, I think you can avoid uh, a, lot of, a lot of harm by deliberately limiting the scope. Also, the commission in this case is really constituted to help the city council and city departments and services to think think about this project, to think clearly about it, and to think about it at all. So the, the commission, as I sort of described it, it has a mandate, but it does not have any power except that it can go to the people and ask them, well, what are you afraid of? What have you been impacted by? What is causing you harm? And bring that back and say to the city, this is what we're hearing, okay? Uh, you know, a little bird told me type of thing. Um, it is meant to be benign. It is not meant to overpower city operations. It is meant to provide a forum for the people to learn about the science and for the science to inform the people where they are in trouble, potentially and likely. And for the people to then say, oh, wow, we're in trouble. And they might elect different council people. They might go to the council and sit in on the meeting. They might say, hey, you didn't, maybe you didn't know this, but we're in trouble, okay? Uh, I, I don't think that that can go wrong. The city council may be uncomfortable with the thought of 2,500 people showing up saying, hey, we're in trouble. But on the other hand, that's how democracy is supposed to work. People are supposed to understand their, their, their situation and to show up and say, hey, we're in trouble. If they're not in trouble, they won't show up. I mean, that's just how that's going to work. But if they are in trouble, the city council needs and wants to hear it. And, and uh, honestly, I don't see how that can go wrong. Okay, Commissioner Fuentes. And Commissioner Marshman, did you have a second question or you just didn't lower your hand? Okay, thank you. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. 
Wadmancy for joining us today and for your very thorough uh, presentation. Um, you know, I, I think uh, probably all of us would agree that this is a serious issue facing our world and in particular our, our city. Um, I guess I'm thinking that, um, I'm assuming that our uh, policing, municipal law accountability and inclusion is going to be uh, working on this, the subcommittee. And, you know, we're hearing it today as a, as a commission, but it's really going to get some more work in the subcommittee. And, um, but I do want to say that, um, that I really like the idea of um, recommending a commission and figuring out how we do that because um, this is such a serious issue. And um, even though we have the Climate Smart San Jose plan, um, the ability of bringing together the scientists plus the non-scientists into a commission to work um, is, to me, sounds has a lot of good potential. And um, and so, you know, I I, I really like the idea. Um, the the one question I have is um, when you um, when you talk about the commission. And, you know, you talk about the scientist and others, you know, working together. How would you actually, um, how would that actually happen? What, what is your, your vision? In other words, like, what would be the scientists involved and how would they be identified? You might have covered this, I might have missed it, but can you explain a little bit more about your idea? Related yeah, I, I, I did uh, mention it a little bit. Um, Again, I don't know how practical my thinking was on this, but the uh, the science community, I, I should say, would be invited. Uh, I don't know how that would work. Um, it might even take a, a while to do some outreach and hit some university departments, hit some uh, YouTube bloggers. You know, it, 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 you know, finding people who would basically join us in this effort remotely or uh, occasionally would require some legwork. Um, I think that there's probably a large pool of people right here in San Jose who would be who would jump at the chance to do this. Me and my community are terrified. People in my line of work are terrified. And that is not an overstatement at all. Um, I think if we can do some outreach, uh, the, the, the people who would be willing to come and join the panel as panelists, as volunteers, would be a fairly large pool. Now, they would want a lot of discretion in how, how often they participate, what their responsibilities would be. I have identified them because I know these people, okay? I have identified them as advisors. They will, they will give advice. They will tell you, no, that's not how it works. They will tell you, uh, you've overlooked something. This is how, this is how it's going to play out. This is what we mean by, by 1.5 degrees C above baseline, industrial baseline. Okay, they can explain things, they can make sense of it, they can bring it down to the level of the people who will have questions. I still don't get it. Could you explain it one more time? I know I'm stupid. Could you please? And they'll say, these are all good questions. We are here to help. And I don't think you'll have any trouble getting these people. I don't think you'll have any trouble at all. Um, but their role in the commission is important to them. They don't want to be burdened with work. Their organizations that, that you know, uh, release them to these tasks don't want them to be burdened with work. They're there to give advice. And I think that so long as that is a requirement and we do a little bit of outreach and figure out how to do that, okay, there's like a little key that has to fit a certain lock, then uh, I don't think you'll have any problems at all. Also, San Jose is a big city. We might not have any trouble at all uh, attracting some big names to this once it gets going. We might not have any trouble at all becoming a uh, proof of concept for other cities. We might export this to other cities. The people who help us on our commission might uh, might work on other commissions in other cities, but even in parallel, this this could really uh, expand. So uh, I, I'm not too worried about how we get those people on board. I'm on board. Here I am. Thank you. I see no other questions. So I want to, on behalf of the commission, thank you, Mr. Wimansi, for your time and your thoughtfulness and your dedication to this issue. Really appreciate you coming before the commission tonight. Um, thank you for having time, me. Yes, thank you for coming. I, at this time, we're gonna open it up for public comment on these 
two speakers and the questions that were asked by the commissioners. So the clerk can call the first speaker on these two guest speakers for tonight. Caller 5140. Caller 5140. Can you hear me? Yes. The Zoom is terrible. Anyway, I, I think that this city, this county, the state, and the federal government are going down a bad road. You are not going to be able to maintain an electrical grid, getting rid of natural gas. Our electric grid is already terrible. It doesn't work. As for passing taxes and things, I just read an article uh, in Europe where in Spain, they, their uh, taxes on electricity and gas have tripled. And that's exactly what you guys are looking for. Spain's done everything. They have all kinds of conservation measures. So I used to live there. Lots of mass transit, lots of windmills, solar. And when I was there, the solar and the wind failed. It just did. It just didn't work. You know, it was the, the, the solar didn't work and the, the uh, windmills chopped up birds and were noisy. It, it just doesn't work. And this is a, this thing, the study hour, you guys think this is a college class. It's not. I, I think you're gambling with everybody's livelihood with these pie in the sky ideas that you're going to magically make. Uh, what what energy we do have go away to, 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 to windmills and solar panels. Those are great for offsetting, but it doesn't make the turbine turn. We need to build dams so we can have water and hydroelectric. We haven't built a dam in this state for decades. And meanwhile, water flows into the, into the Pacific Ocean. We get no water. We get no energy. You guys should all be ashamed of yourselves go back to college where you guys can talk about things like this and get an A on your term paper. You guys are getting an F for me right now for trying to con Paul Soto? Uh, Mr. Woodmancy, it is a pleasure, a pleasure, pleasure to meet you and to know that there are men like you in my city, the city of my birth and the city of my death and the city in which 15 of my ancestors are buried in, that, that, that there is a man like you in this city. So thank you for that presentation. Um, what I saw in the, all of the charts and all the presentations that the gentleman gave was what greed looks like. That's all that was. All those numbers and all those dark red colors, and all, all that was was a measure of greed. It was in this particular committee, it was the smart uh, committees, where I heard that 400,000 people are coming here. That's what this infrastructure is all about. See, what made me skeptical about the gentleman that gave the uh, presentation from Stanford was that he also gave a, a business-oriented solution. That's the problem. It's not the solution. It's the problem. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that these, this, these 400,000 people that are coming here, that is not being talked about. It's being completely ignored within the context of these conversations. And until it is acknowledged commonly that that is a fact, then, then these conversations are kind of like incomplete, okay? Because that infrastructure that they're talking about building is to accommodate people that aren't even here yet. So we're discussing and we're, we're, we're challenging each other and debating ourselves, de debating each other on things that don't even exist. I think Mr. Woodmancy gave the, an excellent uh, framework from which to work from. And what it does is it takes business out of there. I don't want, I'm tired of business being in there, uh, manipulating the uh, committees, manipulating the structure of the city that I live in, in order to make a buck and to. Claire Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you, Blair Beekman here. Uh, the, uh, the, the city manager's letter about the future of the charter process is on this item, but I think it's maybe more appropriate for the next item. I'll, I'll talk about it at that time. 
try to bring a few points, uh, you know, from that uh, onto this item and to talk about the uh, great speakers tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, what Paul Soto said, I mean, we're really at the time to start to be considering like, uh, what is the future of how we're gonna build kind of our foundational selves, you know, for the next 20, 30 years? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna base those things? And I think we're trying to ask, you know, really important questions to set a, a standard and, and some guidelines that we can follow, um, that we can just have available. Robert Brownstein, uh, you know, at the, at the Thursday study session last week, really made clear the ideas, you know, we can talk about the future of uh, low income housing, uh, affordable housing ideas that, that can be very important, yet we don't have to be fully specific on the ideas, but to have a framework to, that describes, you know, the things like climate change, the future of reimagine, equity, open democratic practices, you know, to have, you know, those subjects to have an important set of guidelines, what we're gonna be doing in the next 20 or 30 years, that's our future direction. We could be talking about this charter process and it's vitally important and so much more important than the future of mayor development with, with uh, large corporate developers. I mean, we need to practice our foundational things of these first, that can then deliver the concepts of development for the mayor and, and so forth. But we can't do that until we do these foundational things first. So good luck. Um, what we'll be doing. Uh, I hope we choose these good, the good path. Thank you. Crystal Calhoun. Crystal. Crystal. Okay, moving on to Alina Yin. Evening, commissioners. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. I just want to share some um, things that I found in my research. So in 2017, Mayor Sam Licardo actually signed the Chicago Climate Charter along with 50 other, city, 50 other cities. And this charter outlines already in charter language clear goals that could be built on to reflect the current climate circumstances and new information that was provided this evening. You know, San Jose is doing many of these items and solidifying this in the charter would, I think, further our commitment to future generations, current and future generations, and that this would not be just a one-time effort, but a lifelong commitment towards sustainability for all current and future generations. The planning commission is in the charter because planning space and growth is a part of daily operations and so should addressing climate. And particularly the, the Chicago, Chicago Climate Charter calls out that we must recognize and include in policy formation the voices that have been traditionally up, um, left out of the discussions regarding climate change, including women, um, racially uh, racial impacted communities of color, indigenous people, disability justice advocates, and the socially and economically marginalized communities. I would also add, you know, representatives from the Youth Commission. This particular call has not been realized yet, and you know, currently. The city of San Jose does have the Clean Energy Community Advisory Commission, and they provide feedback and input on development of clean energy program and strategies and operating principles and models. And I feel like, you know, with that commission and the Climate Smart um, that's been operating since 2018 with their data, you know, perhaps there is an opportunity to build off the existing infrastructures under, you know, uh, an equity and inclusion lens, and, you know, to include these historically marginalized voices in the spirit of collaboration, I think this would be a great opportunity to center the lived experiences of the most impacted by climate crisis. Andrew Boone. Uh, thank you. My name is Andrew Boone. Uh, I think that the you know goals to address climate change should definitely be written into the city's charter and definitely written into the general plan. I think it's definitely we are making this whole problem a lot harder than it needs to be by having such weak uh, documents about it. So we have a climate action plan, and that's primarily the document for what we're supposed to do about climate change. However, there are lots of plans like the climate action plan that are just, you know, put them on the shelf and ignore them, like the bicycle plan, uh, the Vision Zero plan, a whole bunch of other plans. They're just plans. The general plan and the charter 
or not. You know, the general plan has legal, you know, it has legally binding policies, as does the charter, and climate change is of such importance, I think, is an understatement to say that if we're not saying anything about climate change in the charter of the city, then why, what are we doing? Why are, why are we a city? Just to keep pumping cars and gasoline in and poisoning the air, you know, we need to do, we need to do radical actions, rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Another thing that I'm not sure, but I believe there's no committee dedicated to the issue of climate change. That's, if that's correct, that's definitely a problem. If there's no group advising the city council and staff on how they're not implementing the climate action plan, then there needs to be. Thank you. Roland. Thank you, and I'm going to be very brief. So we we just saw a lot of um, information being presented here, and I did capture the transcript. But but the thing I find um, disappointing is that there was no presentation slides. Um, you know, essentially capturing and synthesizing some of the um, <clears throat> the key points as to how we could be um, establishing a commission and, and the, um, uh, the mechanics. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because right now, the position I'm in, I'm experiencing serious difficulties figuring, figuring out how we could possibly incorporate um, any of these great um, ideas into the city charter. Thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. You can hear me? Good. Yes. Thank you for having this um, event. I feel so uh, appreciative of uh, the Charter Commission, speci especially um, Magnolia Siegel, for really pushing the people's agenda. So thank you. And, um, you know, if we look at the history of San Jose in regards to their climate work, um, Mayor Licardo jumped in to say that after you know the Trump administration dropped out of the Paris Accord, that the city would meet those guidelines. But we really don't have any. Um, there's no. There's no feedback from this uh, event of what we have. Even that we declared a climate crisis. There's no action that is really monitoring that. And that you know is where. And you know we're doing. We're going in the wrong direction everywhere. We're expanding the airport. Mayor Licardo demanded all the workers come back into the workplace. You know, we didn't, and, you know, and, and change the Metropolitan Transportation Commission's suggestion that we work at home because he wants to heat business as usual. And this is where the, the charter has to come in, is that we're not to be at the whims of the political who is, you know, being controlled by the businesses that run their campaigns. So that's the critical part, why we need it in the charter. And in addition, when we look at the IPCC report, it, it says in the, in the, the, um, the, 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 the scenario that is the greenest, it says that we need to create this future where humans would likely need to achieve a global philosophical shift away from the pursuit of economic growth and toward improvements in human well-being. So that is where we look at it through those lens and everything. That's where, like with the Equity Commission, now with the Climate Commission, we would look at everything through the, the human well-being, which is to reduce our fossil fuels to zero. And that is why we need that commission, so that we, we change our philosophical to look at human. Black outreach. Yes, hi, my name is Pamela Emanuel, and I think that it's really important when we're talking about climate change to also highlight the Hellier Airport that's over in Evergreen. And, you know, that airport spills out tons and tons of toxics every single year that is affecting the community that's living there. And the city has been negligent to try and close that airport down just because it benefits their own profits. You know, when this city was first redlined back in the 1900s, neighborhoods that were redlined today are now 12 degrees harder in the summertime than they are in non-redlined 
to their non red line counterparts. They have less trees, um, you know, and if you think about it, like if you guys really are paying attention to like the needs of the city, you guys would also be talking about those who are unhoused. So just this weekend, over 15, pe 15 plus people lost their homes because of fires. And it wasn't fires that were created from them. It was fires created from just how hot it is and just the 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 kind of embers that spark, you know, and and like the rubbish that sparks and like creates a fire. And so that's that's 15 plus unhoused people, but it's also over 200 plus people who are in that is in that encampment that the city is trying to displace and not find alternative housing for them. You know, when we talk about climate change we we need to talk about those who are unhoused as well we need to provide stability for housing and for safety and protection climate change it's it's terrifying it's terrifying you know i was sick veterinary sick for over a week uh because of the toxins that spilled down from the from the fires and can you imagine those who are unhoused like we really need to be more compassionate in the city and you guys just i feel like you guys just don't hear us i digress i i yield my time Matt King. Hi, Matt King, Sacred Heart Community Service. I am just making double sure that you are going to open public comment specifically on the letter from the city manager. Is that correct? That is correct, Matt. Awesome. Just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Thank you. Yes. I'm going back to Crystal Calhoun. Crystal, are you with us? Okay, taking it back to the commission. Thank you, um, Clerk Tabor. Um, at this point, I'm gonna move us back. Uh, thank the subcommittee again for, for the study session this evening. I'm gonna move us back to our agenda. Um, and as promised, I'm gonna go back to Commissioner Tran. Um, let me walk through for the public's sake of what we're trying to accomplish here. We've heard the, um, the commission voted on August 23rd to ask staff to come back with recommendations on different timings for their report backs to the, to the council. Uh, and so the consultant has come up with three options that he outlined uh, before the study session. At this point, I wanna ask for um, questions and um, discussion from the commissioners. Um, I think that the um, city manager's letter is pertinent to this issue and I think will affect the decision-making thinking around timing. So when I open it up to public comment, then I, it's at that point that I would hear um, public testimony on the, the city manager's letter or any other um, feedback they have around the timing of the recommendations uh, from the commission to, to the council. So I'm gonna go back to Commissioner Quaytran uh, at this point. So thank you, Chair. Uh, the, to the point you just made, though, if this is related to the uh, the letter from the uh, city manager, does it make sense for us to review the city manager before we discuss the work plan or discuss the submission of the report? I, what I'd like to do is ask for any questions on the um, on the proposal itself. Just are there questions about making sure that we're clear on the understanding of it, uh, okay. and then we can open up the conversation uh, more broadly to the. To the city manager's letter which impacts how we're going to uh, which option you may take okay all right um, specific questions on the on the uh, recommendation sure okay i've been actually been my, my question to lawrence um is uh, you mentioned before that uh, you were trying to front load i believe the so the recommended action was to just to move these recommendations to the council based on committee um i have two questions on that one is i think um you were mentioning you were trying to front load it. I was trying to understand the workflow side of this just in terms of um, how that is beneficial. And then uh, on, and then after the referral, I'm actually curious about what happens to these proposals. Uh, one of the reasons why I bring this up is because um, I have been contacted and people have asked me and, and concerned that uh, the proposal to shift the term of mayoral elections could be bunched together or grouped together with the proposals for ranked choice voting and to elevate the fair campaign board, which um, I guess could be a potential risk to the fair election initiative itself. Um, you know, speaking, uh, my, my, I wanna make sure that that is issue can get mitigated specifically because these proposals aren't related 
uh, right? It, it doesn't make any sense to to uh, lump all three of these together and then have them move forward in a way that that, that in, uh, hurts any of these individual proposals because they all should be considered separately as they cover different aspects of voting and elections. And they're not all necessarily tied into each other for their success or for implementation. Yeah, and Commissioner Tran, I would agree. And I don't, I think what we're talking about is submitting them as that theme of the, the recommendations we're making under this just general umbrella, but they're all considered separate uh, recommendations and would not be vote on one, you don't vote on the other. They're, they're not conflated in that way. Um, but we were looking at just thematically bringing them in bunches so that um, the, the council would see what the recommendations are in that general area. Uh, and then the three different areas that are outlined in the, in the proposal. Um, I think that's a strategy question you, I think you should consider because perhaps if we do um, send certain um, items up to the council first, does that mitigate their looking at the other recommendations down the line as seriously, or do we do it all together in December so that they're all considered at the same time? Um, I think it's a strategy question that the commission should think through uh, as you decide which option you're looking at. Are there any other questions to the consultant on the proposal itself? And uh, I see Commissioner Siegel, and I'll just add that, you know, each of the recommendations will be included in th the final report or in, in the final report, uh, you know, one of three or one of two uh, or one of one. Um, and it will be up to council to decide what they do with those recommendations and whether or not they choose to move them forward. So uh, I, I think the chair is right that there is uh, a question of, of uh, presentation strategy and um, you know, really thinking hard as we've heard from, from other speakers in the past about what council is gonna do with these and what's the best way to present them so that you, know, that you have the highest, uh, you mean commissioners, especially for majority recommendations, have the highest chance of, of, of getting council's ear and, and, and uh, interest in, in moving them forward uh, to, to the ballot. Commissioner Siegel. Hi, thank you. Um, on, I see that on all three options, we do have our September 27th um, speaker day, and we do have four stellar um, community policing oversight directors uh, scheduled to come on that day. However, one of our speakers canceled, um, and we're looking to reschedule her as well as we have a whole different topic that the commission has not heard about yet. And those two speakers do need um, to be consulted as to you know whether a particular day that they'll be speaking, whether they're available. And I know that um, we were gonna, uh, I've been asking for when the half day is so I can figure out if they have time. And so I don't see our half day on any of the options, one, two, or three. And if you could kindly give me some choices. Will we be getting choices or how are we to make sure that those two speakers, one that was previously ill and, um, and the three that have to do with a topic we have not heard, uh, the commission hasn't heard about yet. How, how do we, um, when, when do you think we'll be getting those specific dates or choices? Thank you. Um, you know, I think the, the, the answer to that question is dependent on how the commission feels about uh, either sticking to the, to the current timeline or choosing a different timeline. Um, so just to sort of talk through uh, this thought experiment here, um, let me share this. Uh, if, if you uh, all choose to, to stick with this current timeline, um, we have um, you know Monday the 18th, which is a possibility for another study session um, we have two evenings for discussion of police municipal law accountability and inclusion subcommittee recommendations before the public hearing on the 6th. So we could use half of the 18th for, for that, um, that study session. If we are moving forward with two reports, um, the, the, let's see, where, where might we fit it in here? Um, we might, it, it, it gets a bit more challenging. It might be later. Um, it might be, we might have to stack with um, 
the, the final voting on the voting and elections and governance structure recommendations, um, just as an option. Uh, in this scenario, we do three separate reports. Um, you know, maybe we do the same thing, or well, we it gets even a bit more challenging. So, you know, I, I didn't put out a, a, a didn't give you a specific date because there is this larger conversation about whether or not the commission wants to uh, rearrange the uh, timing for delivery of, of reports. Uh, and that's gonna require additional commission time to have those discussions. And so, you know, we can make the time for that additional study session. I, I just wanna do it based on the final guidance from the commission so that we can have a timeline that we can really stick to as much as possible. And, uh, you know, I, I do understand that we need to get back to speakers. Um, uh, it's a juggling a lot of, uh, keeping a lot of balls in the air, as they say. I think though, to Commissioner Siegel, I would suggest that once we decide which of these three options, that within the next two days, we meet on Wednesdays, we could have that discussion and figure out exactly the dates because we want to be able to get those folks scheduled. It would be mid-October is my guess anyway. So, um, but we can do that this week um, after our meeting on Wednesday, we could definitely get back to you. Now that we know it's option X, then here are the dates that we could do so we can get those folks scheduled. Thank you so much. And it will be at least three speakers, two on a new topic, at least possibly a third. Okay. Um, but also the one who um, was ill. Thank you, Chair. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Matsky. Uh, yeah, thank you. When I first raised this, I was kind of thinking, um, since the critical path is the, uh, is the one on the election timing, um, that you know, perhaps we could move something forward and then extend the whole schedule out past December 14th. I, I guess maybe that's not necessarily doable. And also, um, it looks like each option, you can make it work no matter what. So it seems to me if we're not gonna push out the, uh, the final deadline that it, option one seems to be the most logical one to pursue. So I just, I guess I would recommend doing that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's our understanding, you know, that, that there's not flexibility unless there's a formal request. And I, I'm probably speaking out of school here because this is uh, the, the clerk's uh, position, but we are operating under the assumption that the delivery of, of a final report is December 4th, and that's a hard deadline. Um, uh, Tony, uh, Clerk Tabor, do you have anything to share in that? Yeah, to, to, for a council meeting of December 14th, December 3rd is when the memos post. So December 4th is a Saturday. So December 3rd is the Friday. My birthday. That's the best birthday present I could ask for. Probably, is a final sign report. A, sign a final report. <laughs> right. There's nothing better than I want for my birthday. Um, other questions for the, for the consultant? Then let's open the discussion around the city manager's piece. Commissioner Percival? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I I just want to be to be cognizant of of the the work on 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 policing and and I know that's a really important topic to a lot of folks. Um, my only the only thing I wanted to bring up is is um, of the elections issues. It's really the timing of the mayoral elections one that would have the most pressing um, concern in terms of public interest in um, thinking about its its path forward. So, um, you know, we, we would have a stop on the commission for a, for a final vote, then it would go to the council. Um, and I'm only thinking that the implementation of that would have direct effects on next year's, potentially next year's elections. I don't think there's any other uh, policy we're considering or proposal we're considering that would have that kind of immediate effect. So I'm wondering if, if the commission would, would like to debate that yeah. or discuss that for for a few moments whether that makes sense well, to, to push that forward the the question i have uh, commissioner first of all is that any recommendation we make to the charter has to go before the voters so right. so so to pick out one and say well that's the one that has the timing issue because it's the election one all of the recommendations have to go to the voters so i i don't want us to consider this one of them only because that's the one that's going to go to to the ballot for the timing of the issue. All of the issues go. So you could still make 
can still vote that way if you want, but I don't, I just want to make sure that we're clear that our recommendations go to council and they take up the recommendations, but any of the recommendations they accept to charter changes have to go before the voters. Right. No, I under, yeah, I understand that. I'm just saying in terms of the, um, you know, as people think about running for office next year, I agree. filing paperwork, yeah. these yeah. kinds of things that, you know, it may be out of interest of fairness and transparency, what kind of environment that they're running in. So yeah. that's my, but, yeah. but yes, I totally agree with you. And, and that's, that's, yeah. And, and I think we just need to think about, it's about a month's difference. Mm -hmm. It's about a one month difference between um, these different proposals. Um, Commissioner uh, Matsumura. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna try and see if my computer will support video. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what uh, Commissioner Percival was saying. Um, you know, I definitely appreciate the, the significant work that went into playing out scenarios of how we could accelerate the submission of um, different portions of our recommendations to the city council. Um, but I do think that there are two things that are unique to the mayoral timing recommendation, not the overall elections recommendations, just the mayoral timing. The first one is what Commissioner Percival, Percival outlined, that um, it would be helpful to those who are considering or committed to running for mayor in 2022 to have a clearer sense of essentially what they're getting themselves into. Um, and <clears throat> the time period that we're, we're talking about uh, of, you know, a couple of, I, I believe it could be a couple of months difference. Um, and we'll sort of play out how I'm thinking about that in a moment, um, is, is actually a very significant couple of months. It's sort of a, a final stretch as, as people are preparing to, to pull papers. Um, so I do think there's a significant difference there and that, that's sort of my case for why it, it should and is distinct from the others in, in saying that it should move forward faster. I think the other is, is can it move forward faster? And what's unique to, to this potential recommendation as distinct from any of the other items on the table for the commission is just the length of, of time that the issue has been in the public eye. Um, there's, there's no, there's a number of other issues that, that actually could affect the mayoral election next year. Um, whether we would move to mayor council being, I'd say probably top of the list, but that issue has come into the public eye more recently than, than this issue, right? Which has been weighed in on by, you know, tens of thousands of voters who signed petitions really been in the public eye for quite a while. And I think we need to, before we, we try to accelerate a process that, um, to Commissioner Maitzi's point, is already moving quite quickly for anything else, you know, that, that I would be uncomfortable with. Um, I think we really need to give the public process the full time to, weigh out, uh, to play out. But in this case, uh, there's already been a significant amount of public engagement. Now, what I had, I had been hoping to, to be able to consider this week was a path specifically for mayoral timing. Um, and, and so I'm going to lay out how I think that could happen. Mr. Puentes, could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. you. Uh, I'm going to lay out how I think that could happen and then hope to hear perhaps it's um, from from Mr. Vani if, if that's correct. But I, I believe we could, as a commission, uh, you know, should, were we to make and accept a motion tonight, request that the subcommittee draft a letter directly to city council, advancing the recommendation for, for what the potential charter change is to bring back to the next commission meeting um, for us to then be able to review that letter, make any edits or approve it. Um, and then it could move to city council uh, probably for the rules committee one and a half weeks after. So that's, I just wanted to lay out, that's my understanding of how it could move forward. And that's what would allow it to arrive at city council um, probably, you know, 
around mid-October, so a couple of months ahead of the rest of our recommendations. All right, I'm gonna let the attorney hang on to that and finish questions on the, on the question. Uh, Commissioner Tran, then Commissioner Fuentes. A clarifying question about the deadlines because there were dates mentioned that I didn't see in the proposal, which um, there was a mention of a December 3rd and December 4th deadline, but the option, the memo itself says that December 14th is the date for final submission of the reports. Can, uh, can we just go, go clarify just what the, actual, the the firm deadlines are, assuming that we keep December 14th as the deadline? The, the firm deadline for delivering a report? Yeah, but I think you, all, the, the, you and, and Tony earlier were mentioning that there was a deadline on December 3rd and December 4th. Yeah, about. December 3rd is posting for the, the council meeting on December 14th. So uh, anything that's posted at the council meeting, uh, speaking out of turn again for Tony, but has to be posted in advance. So um, we need to be able to prepare, not only draft the final report and get that already, that needs to be reviewed by the city clerk's office, um, you know, probably the, the, the city attorney's office as well, and then prepare, pre be posted in advance of the, of the council meeting. Tony, do you wanna clarify that, that posting date? Yeah, December 3rd, it's 10 days before the council meeting. So that's technically the 4th, but the 4th is a Saturday. So we post on the Friday, two Fridays before. So okay. in this case, it's December 3rd. So in terms of like the hard deadline for when we, we have to have something prepared and submitted, it's by December 3rd so that it can be posted on the agenda. And once that date passes, we don't, we can't change uh, anything that's been submitted. We, we would be violating our sunshine rules. So you, we, we need to post by December 3rd, otherwise we would have to kick it to January. So then there is not a, so the, the, our deadline then for all in relevant intents and purposes is not December 14th, it's December 3rd. Yes, Absolutely. but that's December 3rd to me, but you guys would need to approve it in enough time to get us to sign it, proof it, transmit it yeah so the deadline that if you look at it, i think it's november 20 what's the 29th 29th is when we would have would we as a commission would take the final votes and then from there um the consultants and the clerk can finalize the actual report itself and submit it by december 3rd so giving a very short timeline to finalize the edit get it all done and and submit it so that's why the november 29th monday is approving the final reports. Uh, I see. And, okay. And, and I want to note too that um, something that wasn't uh, didn't make clear, but in our current timeline, we have a couple meetings for sort of reviewing all the reports uh, recommendations together, and then l reviewing a, a draft majority minority report, uh, kind of a complete draft report. The additional options, you know, if we move stuff up, um, it really it gets more difficult to 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 have the time to, to see everything together. So uh, there is a sacrifice in, in starting to move in these other options. Um, but, you know, that, that's just uh, sort of something to be aware of that I didn't mention as, as far as the, these different timing options. Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Fuentes, you're still on mute. I'm sorry. Um, the first thing is um, I want to support for what Commissioner, Commissioner Matsumura was saying in terms of everything that, that she said, especially um, um, taking the time to take action now, um, beginning to take action on the election timing. Um, because it is, I mean, for all the reasons that have already been stated by m several of, of the commissioners, I, I strongly support that, and I think we should try and get that done. I've always thought that, and and we're here. Um, the other thing is that um, I really like um, option three, where we could provide three separate reports, but, well, particularly... Um, I'm not sure because um, I don't see it in front of me right now, but um, assuming that the first report would just be the action on the timing of the elections, 
that recommendation to the city council. Um, and then continuing to work through all the others, because I think that, yes, that that's what it is. Um, because I, well, let's see. Um, when it says final voting and election recommendations, does that include more than the timing of the election? Yes, under this proposal, it does. It, it includes all three. Okay, so then um, I apologize. So I think that I would be in favor of submitting first the the timing of the election and getting that done. Um, I think that's what a lot of people are waiting for that. And it seems to me that we're already ready to, to make a decision on that. And I think it's the most responsible thing to do to get that done and pass it on to city council as soon as we can. And I, I, I really seems to me that we're ready to make a decision on that. Thank you. Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Siegel, you're on mute. All right, on behalf of the Accountability, Policing, Inclusion and Municipal Law Subcommittee, we would like to support Commissioner Percival's request to go ahead, election timing to go ahead. Um, we don't have a problem with that. We're actually still, as you know, in our educational phase. So we could use the extra couple of weeks. Thank you. Commissioner Marshman. I would also like to support that, even though it will have to go to voters and it won't until uh, next year. I think getting it before the city council, making it clear if the council is going to pass it along, they could agendize it earlier. It would give uh, potential candidates and voters, um, you know, more to think about and and uh, to plan for things. So, I'm I'm on board with that as well. Okay, I don't see any more hands. I'm gonna ask um, Attorney Vanny, is the process that Commissioner Matsumura laid out um, accurate? You're on mute. Sorry about that. That is an appropriate process. The commission as a body can um, direct letters uh, and it would go to the rules committee um, and you can delegate it to uh, an ad hoc committee to draft uh, for the entire body's approval. Um, letters, however, do need to come from the commission and be approved by the commission. A couple other things to consider as well uh, with um, just ballot measures in general for, um, for the charter. And I, and I have mentioned these things in the past, uh, and I just wanted to um, uh, inform the entire commission um, as, as far as timing and, and what the council can do with ballot measures. So unlike initiatives, uh, the council is not subject to what's referred to as a single subject rule. So it can bundle uh, different things with respect to the charter uh, as far as amending the charter into one initiative. And the rationale for that is to take advantage of any cost savings uh, that come with doing one ballot measure as opposed to multiple ballot measures to essentially do the same thing, which is amend the charter. Another thing I wanna raise with respect to issues related to policing are some legal requirements uh, that are under state law, both with respect to meet and confer obligations as well as the timing of the election. Uh, so uh, there's something under state law referred to as the Myers Milius Brown Act, which uh, governs labor management relationships uh, in local government and it requires local agencies to meet and confer in good faith with representatives of uh, the recognized employee organization regarding wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. Uh, this is referred to as seal beach bargaining um, and it includes um, meeting and conferring before you even put a measure on the ballot if it's going to affect a term and condition of employment. So uh, any recommendation that will affect a term and condition of employment for city employees, including police officers, is going to be subject to meet and confer. Similarly, under the elections code, um, and this is under section 1415, um, it's in a roundabout way, it essentially says that any ballot measure that proposes to amend a charter in a manner that alters any procedural or substantive protection, right, benefit, or employment status of any local government employee or retiree or of any local government employee organization must be held at a statewide general election in November of each even numbered year. So it can't go at a June primary. It has to go in a November election, either in 2022 or 2024 and so on and so forth. 
So I've asked, um, I've asked Mark to put this in writing as a memo. I was hoping we'd have it tonight because I think it has direct implications for uh, direction for the subcommittee. I think it's super important that they have a clear understanding of, um, I don't want to get down the line and then be caught, you know, we have a recommendation and then, oops, no, you can't make that recommendation because you're not constituted correctly or some other provision of the law takes effect. So I've asked for that memo to be put into writing so that we would have a really clear direction on how, um, what is the procedure that we move forward if we're going to have any recommendations in the police reform era. Um, okay, so, um, but to the first question, specifically on the question of procedure, um, Attorney Danny, can you um, walk us through for the sake of the minutes, uh, what, what, I guess I have a question, if the, if the commission votes on a recommendation, um, why would that not just be the recommendation sent to council? Why, why do we have to go back and forth on a letter? Well, I thought that, and I apologize, Commissioner Matsumura's audio was um, difficult to hear, so I didn't get a full scope of, uh, all I heard was that she had talked about doing a letter. Um, if the uh, body makes a recommendation and votes to put it forward, then it just becomes an issue as to whether or not staff, uh, the city clerk's office uh, is in charge of this, will bring it forward to the rules committee. Um, and it just depends on timing. Um, so I, I don't see it as something that requires a letter if a recommendation comes out, uh, I, but that's what I thought the question was referring to. So Commissioner Matsumura, could you um, uh, clarify your um, procedure? Just I wanna make sure I'm clear because I'm, if, we're, if we're ready or if we're ready for the vote on this, I'm not gonna speak for commissioners saying that you're ready to accept this, but if your proposal is to move this one item forward faster, is it your recommendation that we go through a letter writing process back and forth, or that we just take the procedural vote when it's agendized so that we can move it forward? I'm sorry, can you say what you mean by take the procedural vote when it's agendized? Well, we put it on the agenda that we're going to take a final vote on the, the one issue of the mayoral election. And then that would be the recommendation that we move forward um, to the council. I guess I have a question um, to the committee or to others who can help my memory. Do we have clear enough language from what the committee submitted, uh, you know, around the time of our public hearings? That, that we actually don't need a letter because we've already reviewed the language. I just wanna make sure that if we're, if we're advancing something to city council, yeah. we're all crystal clear Excellent. on, on yeah. what we're advancing. Excellent question. I have a, um, the, the city attorney has drafted the language. So we do have in this case, actual language drafted, which could be the part that goes to the agenda for the, for the vote by the council, uh, by, by the commission for the recommendation. So we do have this particular item from that, from that subcommittee that the city attorney has drafted language, uh, uh, code language. Okay, so that's helpful. And, and I do also see Commissioner Tran's hand with, with that on, on the but question. That, I just wanted to make sure I was clear about what you were suggesting. So your suggestion okay. is that you're supporting moving this forward as expeditiously as possible, whatever manner that is. If we have clear enough language that we won't, you know. Yeah, that we have I'm language. I'm sorry afterwards that we don't actually know. Exactly, no, no, no. The, the recommendation is the language that we're proposing in terms of actual charter language uh, amendments. And that's been drafted. So that could be on the agenda. Uh, I apologize for not being clear about that. Okay. Commissioner uh, Feitran. Yeah, sure, uh, a couple of points. I mean, in terms of just, having language, uh, you know, uh, each of the subcommittees, when they're submitting their proposals, they produce these memos, right? So I do feel that uh, for the recommendations the commission has already enacted, I mean, we already have a language and a template to work from. Um, you know, as a general matter, I do think that on this, the timing of elections, um, because there's been a lot of attention to it, and because this has been a longer standing issue, and because there's, I mean, there, there, it can be a, the potential for targeting it and trying to use a procedural manner or strategy as a way to just tank this um you know it makes sense to move this forward on its own 
but you know, in terms of how the rest of the recommendations are managed, I think if we can do that in a way that that works out for staff considering your workload, uh, and also does give the commission as much flexibility as we can to address all the issues we're trying to address, uh, I think flexibility can be, be be adopted on those other matters. But on this one, I do think we should go ahead and move it forward. Thank you, Commissioner Percival. Uh, a question for Mark, actually, uh, you mentioned that the, the city council has the right to sort of bundle um, these, uh, I'm not sure if it's specifically tied to elections initiatives or, um, but I'm concerned about that. I think other commissioners have as well. Is, is it possible as the commission, although we can't tell what the, to the council what to do, but to make a recommendation that uh, the timing issue is a standalone question uh, to the voters. Uh, the council could certainly override and disagree with the commission, but could we communicate to the to the council that we believe that this is a standalone issue that shouldn't be bundled with other election related issues that could that could theoretically you know uh, you know confuse the voters or add you know other political dimensions to that 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 aren't connected to it if it's a standalone question for the voters. As an advisory body, you can make that recommendation to the council. And as you stated, the council is free to take that recommendation and do with it uh, as it chooses. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. So, uh, and you know, thank, thank you to the chair for clarifying and, and to all for the comments. So, Given this, I would like to make a motion to advance the uh, memo with the language as written by our subcommittee regarding the timing of mayoral elections to the city council uh, on the most expeditious timeline that is practically feasible and allowable under, you know, the laws and policies governing the, you know, decision making in the city. With the commission able to review the actual language. Um, and can I get a second to that? I'll second that. Commissioner Marshman seconds it. So the issue is on the table Thank now. You. Sorry, the issue is on the table now, which is not choosing one of the three options, um, but as a separate item, we'll still discuss that question, uh, but as a separate item saying we're, um, the commission's desire is to move the mayoral election timing uh, as a separate issue, and then we'll come back to the other three questions, the other three options. Discussion? Any questions? Mr. Tran, your hand is up. Is it just not taken down? Yeah, sorry, I'll take it down. Thank you. Chair. First of all, go ahead. I, I just, a, a question on what language we would be using. Commissioner Matsumura mentioned the, the memo. Um, Mark had mentioned language that had been drafted um, in more, you know, formal language. So I'm wondering what we're. It'd be my desire that we use the subcommittee's um, template for the writing of the memorandum with the attached, the commissioners, the commission would look at the memorandum coming from the subcommittee uh, with the actual draft language from the city attorney as the item that comes before you for your approval for your vote so that it's the work of the subcommittee, the discussions and, and the public's input to this, which was extensive, uh, would be reflected in the memorandum and then the actual uh, draft language to the charter amendments. So I think it's a combination of both the commission's work, our hearing of the public and the, um, the, actual, the actual draft language. Okay. City clerk. That sounds good. Yeah, I just wanted to note that we're still on reports, so we cannot do an action. It sounds like this motion would be appropriate under the work plan item, which is agendized for action. Thank you. 
Um, City Clerk, though, we are going to be looking at voting on the options for the timing of recommendations, are we not? Well, I, I thought we were on uh, action on the work plan. We we never left reports from everybody, but I see. Okay, we can just when we get to the work plan, we can say we've already presented the timing, and we'll vote on it then. Okay. But we still need to take public comment on the reports. Correct. And then and that's, we can what I, that's where I was going. Next. Yeah. All right. So, and, and um, Chair, I would I'd, I'd like to get just some additional specific direction as we vote on the timing, also to address. The, the need to get the uh, additional or, or the to, to fill the gap on study sessions for policing municipal law accountability and inclusion. Um, so we, you know, we, we need to fit in a, a procedural vote into the calendar on the timing of mayoral elections and we need to to find that time for the study session. So I just, I'd like to, do you mind if I share my screen and, and present an option and get feedback from folks so that we can just be crystal clear on, on what this timeline looks like? Um, actually, why don't you hold that because we're going to have, okay. we're not going to be able to vote now anyway. Okay. So Great. I'd like to open it up to the public, especially because I know the public is ex, um, anxious to speak on the letter coming before us. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. I did just have a clarification question because um, Commissioner Percival had raised this, this issue of, you know, providing our, our recommendation to city council that this be moved as a standalone uh, ballot item. And um, in in what you just summarized, Mr. Chair, about what we're actually saying we'll move to council, would that be able to include this presentation or, or would that need to move as a separate item? I, um, I mean, that would be the pleasure of the commission, which could say, and we're adopting this measure and we are asking the council to not bundle it with other items, if that was your pleasure. Um, that could be in the memorandum as well. Okay, thanks for that clarification, which I will keep in mind when the time comes for motions. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, I wanna, um, Commissioner Fuentes, could you put yourself on mute, please? Thank you. Um, I want to move to the public because I want to be able to address, I wanna be able for the commission to hear um, September 7th, 2021, I received a letter from uh, our city manager, uh, Jennifer McGuire, our newly appointed city manager, Jennifer McGuire, um, which she also, um, the members of the public also had three um, staff memorandums from June 18th, 2021, March 5, 2021, and July 23, 2020. Um, and in, the, in that, she's stating her position or recommendations and advice to the commission um, on the issue of policing. I bring it up and, and open it up here for the public because it does impact the commission's decision making around the timing of our options uh, in terms of our report back to the to the council. So that's why I'm going to open up now and I appreciate um, that folks have stuck with us from the public this long time um, and I'll ask the clerk to call the first speaker. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. While I'm grateful for the concern of the city manager for my time, um, but it was a bit awkward and almost like paternalistic and presumptuous for her to assume that 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 that's her role, that that is her role as city manager to be so concerned about my time. I spent if this meeting lasted ten hours, I'll be here ten hours. If it lasted twelve hours, I'll be here twelve hours. I commit to forty hours a week. 40 hours a week to these meetings, okay? And I'll do it every single week of my life until I pass. And that is a promise. I do the research. I do everything because I want to come here informed. I want to come here ready. I want to come here prepared because it is too critically important. The Chicano community, and she didn't even consider or consult it. The Chicano community has suffered police brutality from the 1940s on. John Steinbeck wrote about it. Read, uh, 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 I would suggest the city manager read Starvation Under an Orange Tree, written by John Steinbeck after he spent time in Salsipuedes. 
And that's number one. Number two was the, you had the Brown Berets, you had uh, Sofia Mendoza, you had uh, Consuelo Rodriguez that were teachers and uh, community members at Roosevelt Junior High School back in 1968. Okay, when the brown, when the black berets came and protected those children, took them to William Street Park and then brought them back. Okay, and they suffered for it because when the San Jose High School students walked out, their heads were bashed in by the police department. There is an extensive history that is not being centered within the context of these conversations. And 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 this is this is the part where she didn't even consult us. And that was that point was articulated beautifully by uh the the ex. And now I know why he's the ex, the ex police auditor, Aaron Sicer. And so I would also ask for Lloyd Alabon, you know, put some more balanced reporting inside Spotlight, dude. B put in both sides of the story. Joe Guevara. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Juan Guevara, and I'm the executive director of Sacred Heart Community Service, and I'm going to read a letter into the public record. Um, uh, dear commissioners, on behalf of uh, the undersigned 30 community-based organizations, we're writing to express our support for the deliberations of the City of San Jose's Charter Review Commission on the development of, of a Community pu uh, Public Safety Oversight Commission. We believe if properly designed, such a commission may serve a constructive role in developing effective solutions to evolving public safety needs over time and may provide critical public oversight that could help communities regain confidence in law enforcement. Moreover, we believe that a proposal for such a commission is an appropriate role of the uh, of the Charter Review Commission as it works to make recommendations for key structural change changes in city governance. Many of our organizations are directly involved in the reimagining public safety community advisory committee and have been engaged in the conversations with, uh, with the uh, Charter Review Commission on this matter. We see the, the commission uh, conversations about structural changes as complementary, timely and helpful, and, and a helpful component to the policy and systemic re reform focus of the reimagining process. Uh, while we understand the concerns identified in the letter from city manager uh, McGuire, we were not contacted by her, nor do we support her conclusion that, that conducting, uh, quote, conducting two separate public processes on police oversight could potentially confuse members of the public who want to engage on this issue, unquote. It is our collective responsibility to ensure community voices are heard and represented in these processes, and we commit to maintaining contact and coordination with the commission uh, to ensure there is alignment on a final proposal. We understand that uh, the, the necessity and opportunity to, uh, to create effective change will not fall on any one committee's or commission's uh, process or shoulders, but all of this as one community. Our organizations want to create a community where, where residents feel involved in addressing public safety concerns, and therefore we support the, the uh, re uh, Charter Review Commission's efforts to develop um, a proposal for a Community Public Safety Oversight Commission. Thank you. And it's signed by 30 organizations. Thank you. Sandy Perry. Hello, I'm uh, Sandy Perry. I'm with the Affordable Housing Network and CHAM Deliverance Ministry. And uh, we're here to urge the <coughs> commission to adopt the proposal and uh, uh, to uh, make a decision, agendize this at your next meeting, make a decision to move the mayor ele election uh, change proposal to the city council as soon as possible. This is gonna have an impact on the 2022 election including who runs for mayor based on the possibility of a two-year term. And uh, we feel it's very important to get this up there as soon as possible. This will increase turnout. We're at a time when democracy is hanging in the balance in America. We're just uh, coming through a very weird uh, re uh, recall election process where potentially 24 per a party that represented 24% of the population uh, could have had a good chance to uh, uh, install a governor. Uh, and uh, we need to pay attention to these issues. The question of moving the uh, election, mayoral election to the presidential years is going to have a dramatic impact on political participation. We're in favor of it, and we're in favor of moving it forward as fast as possible. Thank you very much. Jeffrey Buchanan. Hi, uh, Jeffrey Buchanan on behalf of Working Partnerships USA and uh, Silicon Valley Rising. I um, want to thank uh, uh, all the commissioners that spoke out tonight in favor of moving quickly to uh, support moving to council the conversation around moving our mayoral election for all the reasons that have been discussed. Um, 
you know, at a time when so much of the conversation in our nation is about what to do about voter suppression, it would really be a, a, a powerful move by this commission to send its first recommendation to council. Uh, in the words of uh, Commissioner Percival, you know, the single strongest policy for expanding voter participation in our mayoral race moving forward. And so uh, for all the reasons that folks have discussed in particular because of the timing, uh, when we think about uh, uh, potential candidates for mayor launching their exploration committees, uh, that that activity uh, could be occurring before uh, the, the current timeline uh, for when this commission would just deliver uh, their recommendations before the council would even you know, they'd still be weeks away from, from council uh, hearing those recommendations at that point in mid-December that was laid out in the staff recommendations. So it's, it's really important for this particular issue, for all the reasons folks have laid out, it's the one issue that is gonna impact uh, both the decisions of candidates and to some extent the decisions of voters in terms of what it is they're voting for uh, come uh, this June in the primary and, and certainly uh, later in the general election. Uh, and. You know, we've talked to tens of thousands of voters across the city about this one. So let's let's move this forward. Let's let's stand on the side of democracy uh, and let's move move as quickly as possible on moving this as a single issue uh, and putting it as a single issue before the voters. Thank you so much. Um, Nihar Agrawal. The city manager mentioned that if the Charter Review Commission continued discussing and recommending improvements to community safety initiatives, it would confuse the public or hinder progress in some other way. Do not worry, our communities are in lockstep to make sure the process goes smoothly. The Charter Review Commission has responsibility and power to make our city safer. So why wouldn't we use all the governing bodies we have to ensure that community safety is actually reimagined in a real way and all of our residents can feel safe? I yield my time. Caller 5140. Well, first of all, I want to tell everybody listening to vote yes on the recall and uh, vote for Larry Elder because uh, this state is going down the tubes, as is San Jose. And uh, Mayor Licardo, anything that gets him out is good for me, but a city manager form of government's no good either. It's very bureaucratic, but at the same time, would you want someone like Sam Licardo running the show? It's bad enough the power that he has now. And there's just no saving this town. You got police and fire costing us, what, about a billion a year, roughly, combined? Buildings burn down, crime goes on, crime never gets solved. I mean, I know we have a lot of parades, with flags and stuff, but, uh, you know, there's toy giveaways, but, uh, do things really ever get solved around here? You know, burned out buildings that, that are still left derelict in uh, what I call Detroit district nine, where I live terrible. Um, I don't know what's going to save this town. It's just, there, there just isn't good governance. It's just, it's a term paper that this city council and this mayor are trying to write. With, with the oversight of a city manager who really is just a bureaucrat in the end that doesn't do it that doesn't do anything so i don't know what's going to happen but uh, i do know one thing this city is run very poorly uh they're not repaving the roads as fast as they say they are and these ridiculous urban villages trying to cram a bunch of people in on an all-electric grid because they're afraid of natural gas I think these people are afraid of their own farts as far as I'm concerned. People are doing a terrible job with that. And if you think you're going to run on an all electric grid, you're crazy. It's not going to work. You're going to go down. It's going to go down the tubes like Venezuela if they try to run this place. Crystal Calhoun. Hello, my name is Crystal Calhoun. And I am an elder leader of the San Jose Unified Equity Coalition and with the Derek Sanderland organization here. I reside in District 2, Sergio Jimenez District. And the reason I think the commission should still uh, study public safety without police, because police don't make it safer. 
It just costs us a lot of money. So the reason I'm like this, I'm a mother of three adult sons. I have, uh, I have 14 grandchildren, eight girls and six sons. I am more concerned every time they walk out the door or from their homes that I'm more concerned about how to handle the police than how to handle the what we so-called um, criminals that we have here. It's a shame that when my young children, by the time their grandchildren, my children, by the time they're six, we have to have the police talk. But then when I talk to my white, uh, white uh, friends and stuff, they never have to have a talk with a six-year-old about the police and how you've got to say, yes, sir, no, sir, and you got to stand there. Police does not make it safer. We need to reimagine and look at different ways of uh, getting the community involved in everything. We could work with better housing. We could work with the mental ill. We have so many options here that we could work with other than the rich police. They got a budget here in San Jose of more than $470 million a year. And the police got a 300% over budget under Sam Licardo that the police can just work hundreds of hours of overtime and not even explain anything. So I don't like her stopping this commission without the voices of all of these different organizations here, because we're all in it together. I love San Jose, and I want to take care of San Jose. Vote no to stop this. Thank you. I'm Crystal Calhoun. Robert Brownstein. Good evening. I'd like to make three comments. First, I'd like to support the proposal by Commissioners uh, Matsumura and Marshman regarding the change in the election timing. That's the only proposal that has a legitimate reason for moving forward on a fast track. Uh, everything else should really be based on the amount of time it takes uh, the commission to feel that it's doing due diligence and putting together solid recommendations. Um, you really shouldn't be trying to uh, put recommendations forward in some kind of effort to game the city council and 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 do that kind of effort. Uh, probably won't work anyway. Um, second um, uh, point I want to make is uh, Mr. Vani is correct when he pointed out the timing uh, issues that are associated with uh, making changes in um, in the police department, uh, but it's important to recognize those timing constraints apply to whoever makes a proposal for changes in the police department. It applies to this commission. It applies to the Reimagining Public Safety Group. It applies to the City Council as a whole. You are not in any way um, facing more constraints than anybody else if you decide to work on this issue. And finally, I think the, uh, the city manager's letter is open to criticism. She's entitled to write a letter, everybody is, but her letter um, seeking to get this commission to refrain from paying attention to law enforcement issues on behalf of the Reimagining Public Safety Commission, when the Reimagining Public Safety Commission hasn't issued that request, uh, is not, a, a, I think, a, an impressive proposal. Thank you. Sandra Asher. Hi, good evening. My name is Sandra Asher, and I'm a member of the Reimagining Public Safety uh, Com Community Advisory Committee, representing the disability community. I'm also a board member at Parents Helping Parents and Community Solutions, as well as a member of Surge and Rex at Sacred Heart. I live in San Jose District 10. First, I want to thank you for your time serving on this important Charter Commission. The city manager says that the Charter Review Commission study on police oversight is in conflict with the process of the Reimagining Public Safety Committee. As a member of the Reimagining Committee, I wholeheartedly disagree. I feel strongly that our two entities should collaborate on this important issue, and I firmly support recommendations made by the Commission as part of the City Charter Review. I've attended your study session on August 23rd and feel you're doing good work here and have, are having important conversations. I welcome the opportunity for the Charter Commission to partner with the appropriate RIPS members and subcommittee. Please vote no on stopping the review of police oversight. Our communities are counting on us to work together to make a stand for true police accountability. The lives of our community depend on it. Thank you. Rachel Kumar. 
Hello, my name is Rachel Kumar. I'm a resident of District 9, and I've got a comment about the city manager's letter to the commission. The important dialogue on police reform in San Jose must include the voices of our community, and that's why I value the work of this commission and of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. I'm concerned that the city manager's request isn't coming from this review commission and isn't coming from the Reimagining Public Safety Committee. It, they're not asking for this change, and they've not expressed any concern with operating in tandem. It seems to me the city manager is imagining an issue where none exists. I'm also concerned that making this change would halt this commission's progress towards recommendations on police oversight, telling us, the public, to wait even longer for recommendations from an advisory committee that just recently got redefined and expanded. This Charter Review Commission already has its plans in place and its work in progress to develop recommendations on policing within the next three months. Why should we postpone any action? This commission has the specific responsibility to consider charter amendments that will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion. And that's not a responsibility that should be handed off from one committee to the next. The way I see it, we currently have two groups looking at a very complex and crucial topic from different angles. And there's no reason we have to put all of our eggs in one basket. Even the independent police auditor, Aaron Zisser, suggested we allow both the charter review process and the reimagining public safety committee to deeply consider and make their recommendations on this important topic of policing with community involvement. We should welcome the additional community involvement. We should bias towards action when it comes to police accountability. I expect this Charter Review Commission to accept its responsibility to the community and to continue the job you were asked to do. You have a responsibility to act to make policing safer for our community. Thank you. Alina Yin. Evening commissioners, um, I wanna echo what has already been said by the community. I think the reason representation matters is that we have people with the direct lived experiences speaking for themselves. It's really unclear whom the city manager, Jennifer, Jennifer McGuire, newly appointed by the mayor, is speaking with or on behalf of what information. As her letter and the letter read by Poncho earlier, written by the community members, organizations, and participants of the reimagining public safety, more than conflicts with her statement of the spirit of collaboration. Such a disparity in perception seems very peculiar. Additionally, we've had a lot of study sessions on the forms of government, including the role of the city manager, but the letter written by the city manager, McGuire, seems to contradict all those presentations given to this commission on the roles and responsibilities of city manager and of being a chief administrative officer. And from what I've read in Article 7, Section 701, that outlines the city manager powers and duties. From a community perspective, you know, this commission is honoring the council directive two, which is to research and solicit community input on the strong mayor and other potential charter reforms to improve and update city governance. And the commission is also honoring our community members that have spoken in support of this study session, especially on August 9th, where we met for nearly six hours on this topic, which is directive five to consider additional measures and potential charter amendments as needed that will improve accountability, representation, inclusion, and San Jose, in the city of San Jose. And so I highly encourage that, you know, the commission stay course because you're doing everything that the council has directed and that the community is asking for. And we have not asked the city manager to speak on our behalf to make these recommendations on our behalf. This is not what the people want. And the people that have spoken in public comment today have clearly articulated what they want. Thank you. Alex Carabello. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to speak tonight on behalf of uh, Commissioner Matsumura, Percival, and Marshman's um, topic around moving the mayoral election. I absolutely agree with their synopsis of why it's so important to move uh, the mayoral election to presidential years. Um, this subject has been vetted by tens of thousands of our city residents. We've been talking about this issue for roughly the last two and a half years, and it's incredibly important to making this city much better represented by those at the top. Right now, we are currently voting for a mayor in off, uh, off presidential year election. Year. The overall population of the city is not participating in who's the one seat that rules them all and that oversees the entire city as a whole. Please uh, support the motion made by uh, Commissioner Matsumura and let's get this in front of the city council as soon as possible. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Tessa Woodmancy.
Thank you. Well, I just think that um, we don't need to be focusing on all this political stuff in general. I think that the issue of you know changing the election date, I don't think is that critical. I mean, we have so many critical crises going on, especially our climate crisis, and that we need to be focusing on that. And really, it was given a short shrift. And even in this um, this commit, this whole commission has been given a short shrift. And so, you know, to be you know so much time on politics is really not not uh, healthy for our um, well being going forward. And you know, so that's how I feel about it. I think it should just be left the way it is. You know, especially because. Um, you know, I think just focusing on the mayoral election without having to deal with the presidential, I think is better. Plus, I think we have so many critical issues to deal with that we don't have to be distracted with politics and economics. And then getting back to um, the issue with the um, the police reform. So when I looked at this up, um, uh, the whole issue, and I try to find out about this reimagining so I go to their website. It's like totally hidden. I had to write the city manager's office saying I couldn't even find the issue of this reimagining commission. I guess it's some, uh, you know, whatever it's called now. And so it was like hidden. And it's, in, it's actually in the city manager. Like who was going to go to the city manager's website to find this advisory committee? So that is all BS as far as I'm concerned. Her concerns about public engagement. You know, this is such, they did such a bad job of even putting it on the website. It's not among the commissions. Plus on top of, even when they did their commission website, you have to jump to sub page. That's how it is. That's how the commissions, are. so it's very poorly done in general. And then for this commission to be put in this, under the city charter, I mean, the city manager, it was just totally. Lucky Jordan. Lucky Jordan. Go ahead. Lucky, you're unmuted. Okay, I'm going to come back to you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, Tessa and I have talked a bit about this item uh, uh, recently, and you know we're the opinion that you know we don't have to make any final decisions about the memo right away. I think we can wait until at least early October to kind of you know gauge the situation and figure out you know get more opinion from people about what to do. Um, you know, it, it, I think the ideas of, of, of making this process uh, continue through into November that was mentioned earlier by city government at the beginning of the meeting are really important and we should respect that, I feel. Um, I think Jennifer McGuire, the city manager has offered some interesting uh, ideas, um, but we, you know, like most people maybe doesn't know how to explain it fully well yet. Um, there, is a, there is an issue of overlap between reimagine and, and the city charter commission on the, on the issues of reimagine, I'm guessing to some degree. I think there can be ways to work this out so we can keep both processes going to work on the questions of reimagine, but maybe how to address the projects a little differently. And I've mentioned before the, re the city charter commission can take a more broad view to consider ideas of reimagine and, and put it in the framework of the city charter the same way uh, uh, the future of affordable housing can be that Bob Brownstein explained last Thursday. And that can be done with several issues. Um, you know, I've been warning yourselves for months now that I'm really afraid what McGuire's memo is offering is a, is a way to begin the process of a, the strong mayor stuff with development. I'm really worried that's going to be starting up. We need to have a language in how to discuss this better and not really, we can have that sort of conversation, but we have to use the principles of what we're talking about of community as how to gauge the future of this conversation. Thank you. Peter Ortiz. Hello, Honorable Charter of Review Commission. My name is Peter Ortiz. I'm a community organizer and leader from District 5 and a former member of the original Reimagining Public Safety Advisory Group for our city. I want to thank this body for your important, important work, as well as thank Commissioners Barracio and Amador for representing our council district. 
First off, I want to thank the members of this commission for speaking in favor of moving the mayoral election to presidential years. As we all know, voter suppression has been an effective instrument used to silence the voices of working families and communities of color. You can see this directly in the lack of voter turnout in District 5 during the mayoral midterm elections. We must be unapologetic when we call out that voter suppression is the true reason why mayoral elections are held during these years. It's important that we empower as many residents as possible to participate in determining who runs our city. And we can do this by moving mayoral elections to presidential election years. I also would like to comment to state my support in favor of empowering the Charter Review Commission to take up the important deliberation of a Community Public Safety Oversight Commission. Most cities of our size have community oversight bodies. Oversight bodies are key to building public trust and accountability, and it is perfectly within purview of this commission to discuss a formation of an oversight body as a recommendation to the council. The purpose of the Charter Commission is to put neighborhood leaders in the driver's seat in order to make the substantial decisions that will directly affect our families. As mentioned by speakers earlier in the meeting, this process needs to be led by the appointed community leaders and cannot be dictated by city leadership. I thank you all for your dedication to your city and please, uh, I ask you to vote no. Thank you. Gabby Lopez. Hello, I read that the commission is considering to include racial and social justice standards for budgets and major policy decisions to ensure groups such as ethnic minorities are not disproportionately harmed by proposed laws. As a minority, this statement gave me hope. I used to run this, a small home business and unfortunately the police were called to resolve issues. I was fabricated at the lawlessness I witnessed by some officers, including violating constitutional rights, trying to enforce civil matters, and a lack of interest coming into our communities and actually making a difference. It seems the mission for 50% of the department is to intimidate, create arrestable, an arrestable environment and or kill minorities rather than serve and protect. This has been my experience 50% of the time when engaging with San Jose Police Department. Furthermore, reporting to internal affairs resulted in no real accountability. Governments shouldn't be creating laws to earn revenue, but rather to seek justice. And there is zero justice in creating revenue, excuse me, in creating revenue generating laws. I don't understand why people have to pay to do community service. Maybe if they did it, jails would be less crowded with nonviolent offenders and our streets would be cleaner. I hate seeing the city that I've loved for over 40 years turning into a garbage dump and knowing that jails are creating mental health issues and repeat offenders rather than providing real deterrence or rehabilitation skills. I think that the city needs a rude awakening. The mayor's office has had control and has chosen to ignore how minorities are treated and I strongly support social and justice standards to be tied to budgets. Thank you for your time. Black Outreach. Hi, yes, my name is Pamela Emanuel, and I just want to thank Sacred Heart for putting taking the time to um, get all authority organizations to sign off on the letter that they wrote. I think it shows how much the community wants this reimagining of public safety. Um, you know, I think <laughs> the letter that was written by the city manager along with the mayor is honestly tacky and it shows their hidden agendas on silencing the community. We have said multiple times in this meeting that we would want a reimagining public safety commission and you guys continue to ignore that. So I'm here today again to say that this is what the community wants and to advocate for a city charter. I, I don't I don't understand how many times we have to scream it into your face, you know, uh, and it's I, I yield my time. Mika Estramera. Good evening. My name is Mikael Mika Estramera. Uh, I'm a resident and attorney here in San Jose. Uh, I'm also a board member of three member organizations of the original and new 
uh, reimagining uh, working group, the NAACP, the Larasa Roundtable, and the Bill Wilson Center, all of whom, along with myself, are signatories to the letter that Mr. Guevara read earlier. I would join in his comments and, and several other members of the reimagining group. And I just want to, uh, to avoid being repetitive, emphasize uh, recent context, uh, because in the original reimagining group, the city manager's office did or attempted to do the same thing that they're attempting to do here, which is to curtail the scope of the work and to prevent us from considering police reform and oversight. And I was one of the original seven who walked away and urged my colleagues to do the same. And we did that. And that is a form of uh, public information for this group. What you saw there is what the public wants, which is consideration of reform and oversight. We are still waiting for the government in San Jose to do something in response to the wave of outcry from the George Floyd murder. And you should all seize the opportunity to devote substantial resources to, uh, to make change, to increase oversight, and to make reform. And that's the true message from the community, uh, not the baseless claims of public confusion that the city manager has made in an attempt to preclude consideration of reform and oversight. I'm a mem member of Reimagining. I will work with you to align and collaborate on police oversight and reform. Thank you. I'm gonna try Lucky Jordan again. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lucky Jordan. I work with Hero Tent, a community organization here in San Jose. Regarding the city manager's letter, I encourage you to allow the CRC to continue discussing and working on police oversight. As everyone has stated, the Reimagining Public Safety Commission did not ask the city manager to recommend that the CRC stop discussing police oversight. I am also part of the Reimagining Public Safety Commission, and our work can happen hand in hand with the CRC's work. I want to remind you all why we are doing this and why we need police oversight. The police have been and are continuing to traumatize people in our community every day. In America, police brutality, racially targeted police brutality, particularly towards indigenous black and brown people, has been defended and legalized at the local, state, and national level in legislative, judicial, and executive branches. There cannot be too much oversight of people who walk around our communities with weapons, with guns who are legally defended when they kill people, who do this while wearing plain clothes and unmarked vehicles. In January, the SJPD undercover unit murdered David Tovar Jr. In May, they murdered Demetrius Stanley just over 100 days ago. In the case of Demetrius Stanley, they had ample time to drive away or could have locked their car door easily. They left his body in the street for hours while they harassed his family and refused to give them any information about what happened to him. The police are inflicting trauma and violence on our community, particularly the indigenous black and brown communities every day. We need as many of us engaged in oversight as possible. This is a justice and public health issue and the city manager and unelected official should have no say in this. Thank you. Laver Foster. Hey, my name is Lavere Foster and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. I fully support the Charter Review Commission developing a Community Public Safety Oversight Commission. It would actually be beneficial if the Reimagining Committee and the Charter Review both work together on this matter. My concern is that the city manager did not consult with Reimagining Committee before writing the letter and therefore does not speak for us regarding this matter. Our community based organizations want to create a community voice in addressing public safety and its needs and policies. And I support any item that comes from the Charter Review Commission that moves us forward in accomplishing that goal. Thank you. Tina Najibi. Hello, my name is Tina Najibi and I'm a homeowner in District 6. I'm also a software engineer. In software development, we have multiple processes in place to ensure the quality of our code. None of us thinks that our code has issues, but the processes are in place anyways. Imagine if we had less quality control resulting in your car, your TV, or your phone not working. I feel the same applies to our police department. Most of the time, I feel the police are doing a fine job. However, processes need to be in place to monitor that fact. If nothing goes wrong, all is well. If there is an issue, it gets investigated and either it's deemed to be okay or it's fixed. 
This does not bog down the process. It enhances and improves the process. It creates a better police force and a more trusting community. I therefore urge you to support the Charter Review Commission study on police oversight. Thank you. Kiana Simmons. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Kiana Simmons and I am the president of Hero Tent. I'm also um, a committee member on the Reimagining Community Safety Advisory Commission, and I'm one of the 30 people who signed on the letter. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm in favor of uh, this group uh, bringing the, uh, the police to the forefront of the conversation, and I stand with um, the Community Public Safety Oversight Commission and, and their proposal. Um, and I just wanted to say that the city manager is not an elected official, um, not elected by the public, um, and yet they have this new authority. Um, and I would just want to echo all of my colleagues on this call. Um, it's very authoritarian and, uh, you know, huge dislike, not good. Um, I yield my time. Thank you. Roland? Good evening, uh, Commissioners. First of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, Chair Thierry, uh, Commissioner Tran, Commissioner Percival for making it very clear that we do not want any battling of charter amendments on the ballot. Moving on to timing of the elections, uh, there is no question that we will have an election next year and that the charter amendment to change the timing of the mayoral election will be on the ballot. But I believe that the commission should continue to work beyond December on other potential changes to the charter. Moving on to the um, city manager's letter, I personally feel that the contents of that letter have been uh, mischaracterized by various um, entities. And my recommendation right now is to support the city manager's um, recommendation to defer discussions on, on uh, po uh, po policing to the reimagining public safety community advisory committee as long as the process is as transparent as this charter commission. Um, in closing, I would suggest that the charter commission consider number one, recommending that the chief of police be elected just like the county sheriff is elected. Number two, that so should the city manager. That should be an elected position, not uh, appointed. And while you at it, you might also consider the city attorney and the city controller. Thank you and good night. Susan Price. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Susan Price uh, Jane, and uh, I'm a, a leader with PACT, and I live, I'm a homeowner, and I live in District 6. Um, <clears throat> I am speaking to the issue of moving the mayoral election uh, to the presidential election years. I, I heartily support that, and I hope the commission will expedite whatever it takes to make that happen as soon as possible. Um, the... We need to do this in the interest of, of um, ensuring greater participation in our elections in San Jose by all groups. And the best way to do that is, according to the study by political science, scientists that was uh, submitted to the commission, is to uh, put the, pres the mayoral election the same year as a presidential election. And I certainly hope that you will do that because we need to get more people involved in these in these elections and that's how to do it. Thank you very much. Krista De La Torre. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Krista De La Torre and I'm speaking on behalf of the South Bay Labor Council. We encourage the commission to send the proposal to move future mayoral races to presidential years as a standalone measure for the June 2022 election. 
The commission will have time to work on the rest of its recommendations, but FEI is the only proposal that will have an impact on the 2022 election. And for transparency's sake, the decision on placing it onto the ballot should be made public as soon as possible. So candidates filing to run for mayor in 2022 know their term may only be two years. Furthermore, FEI is the only proposal that has already been vetted by tens and thousands of voters in San Jose and who signed petitions to have it placed on the ballot. FAI is also the only proposal that has been called the single best way to increase voter turnout by political scientists. And lastly, FEI is the only proposal that has that was supported nearly unanimously by the commission. Commissioners, we appreciate the work you're doing and the thoughtful policy recommendations that you are considering. Thank you so much for your time. Lou Dimes. Yes, I would like to talk about the city manager's uh, letter trying to shut things down that don't have nothing to do with her or the mayor. I think everybody here needs to understand the fact that there was an entire social uprising that happened this past year. And a lot of people were very upset about the fact that Black people want justice for the injustices that are being placed upon us. And we went out into the streets and we messed up a lot of shit. San Jose got off really easily for being a top 10 city, and it didn't get raised to the ground like cities like Minnesota, Portland, and Seattle did. Now, a lot of people, people like people in this commission, told young protesters that they need to do things the right way and go about the ways that democracy has set things up for us to try and vote on these issues that we care about instead of taking to the streets. And all you've shown us with these systems that you have set in place is that it's convoluted, it wastes people's time and it doesn't accomplish anything. And if we do try and do it, you're gonna try and subvert us. So you really have to ask yourself, do you wanna give people a chance to do things the right way? Or do you want more young people out in the streets pissed off, fucking shit up and slowing down your day and possibly burning things down? Cause that's what is gonna end up happening the way things are going in San Jose. You like to act like we're in a bubble, like what happens in places like Philadelphia and Detroit and LA can't happen here. And I'm here to tell you that it definitely can. And you need to count yourself lucky that it didn't happen earlier. But don't keep playing with people's emotions. And everybody, all of you are all public faces. People know who you are and shit can come back to bite you in the ass. God don't like ugly and y'all looking mighty disgusting. That's all I have for my time. Expand police oversight. Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, frankly, the gist of my uh, comment is I'm kind of confused why we're wasting uh, so much time on a comment from an unelected official uh, who didn't even bother to co consult with the committee uh, that they want to have this kicked over to that uh, members of that committee, uh, numerous ones have actually already made the comments during this meeting, uh, not only that they weren't consulted, but they have expressed direct opposition to the city manager's recommendation. Ergo, my recommendation is to throw that letter in the trash where it belongs and let's get back to work. Thank you. Rupini. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Rupini. I want to express my concern that the city's disinterest in police accountability is inappropriately influencing this committee. Uh, the public has been calling for greater transparency and independent investigation of the police as exists in most other large cities. Uh, but San Jose has completely failed to act on this issue, even after two separate instances this year of undercover SJPD officers assassinating San Jose community members, David Tovar and Demetrius Stanley. Uh, and now the city manager, without consulting anyone on the Reimagining Public Safety Committee, has unilaterally decided to ask this body to stop looking into expanding public oversight of the police. I just really have a hard time understanding this as anything except an attack by the city on efforts by community organizers to take a multifaceted approach to stopping uh, SJPD from acting with complete impunity. Uh, the issues of police accountability and studying policing alternatives are both absolutely vital, 
uh, and given the importance of public safety to the San Jose community, I hope that both the Charter Review Commission and RIPS uh, will be encouraged to continue their work on these issues uh, and collaborate to align their recommendations without any more inappropriate interference from an unelected city manager. Thank you. Sandra? First, I would like to thank all of you for your time. This is definitely a challenging experience, I'm sure, with all the input that's come in. So again, I want to thank you for your time. I am actually going to say that I support the city manager's letter in the sense that there is another group working on this. Let that group finish their work. If that group is dysfunctional or not, for, or not working correctly, then let's fix that committee. Additionally, I know that you all have heard from various people on police, and I wrote a letter earlier to you that I'm concerned that there was only one-sided input on that particular presentation and other items and people to come speak. So if you do decide to proceed, let's make sure you're getting balanced input as well. Again, thank you for all your time and energy on this and for your dedication to improving our city. Brenda Doman. Hi, yes, I'm from District 10 and I'm calling in um, as a victim of crime and as well as a citizen of the city. And I agree with uh, McGuire's letter. I think having three different uh, groups overseeing the, um, the police is a lot of duplication in effort. I think one is enough. You just have to get the one right. And I would appreciate you, you know, looking at the efficiency, you know, that it, it would just be very inefficient for three different groups dealing with police matters, overseeing the police. I think it's ridiculous. Also, I'd like to talk about the <clears throat> moving the um, election to the presidential election schedule. I, I'm in disagreement about that too, because I think that the mayor, mayor election in San Jose should focus on San Jose and not about national politics or party politics. We need to solve San Jose's problems with our elections, not the nation's problems. And to have our election just about San Jose would be the best way to, to do that. I uh, yield my time. Thank you. Myra Palagio. Hello, good evening. My name is Myra Pelagio, and I am the executive director for Luna Latinos United for New America. And I am here to encourage the commission to send a proposal to move future majors races to presidential years as a standalone measure for the June 2022 election. Fair elections is the only proposal that will have an impact on the 2022 election. And for transparency's sake, the decision on placing it into the ballot should be made public as soon as possible. So candidates filling up feeling to run for mayor in 2022, no, their term might only be two years. I want to encourage you to do everything in your power to expedite the process to establish this fair elections initiative. I am also part of the Reimagining Public Safety Committee, and we support the work that the Charter Review Commission on developing a community public safety oversight commission. Most cities of our size have such a community oversight bodies, and it is time for San Jose to establish one. These commissions are critical to providing public oversight to law enforcement in ways that can rebuild public trust, transparency, and accountability. The commission can and should work with the reimagining process to coordinate efforts and solicit community feedback so they are not in conflict. The city manager did not consult with the reimagining committee about concern and does not speak for anyone associated with the community. Thank you, I yield my time. Matt King. Uh, Matt King, Sacred Heart Community Service. Not a whole lot different to say than what so many folks have already said. I just want to re-stress that it's not even a question of whether or not you agree with the city manager's opinion. 
it is that she has no place whatsoever trying to put her thumb on the scales of this process. She doesn't, the mayor doesn't, no members of the city council have any place trying to influence your deliberation. They will have plenty of opportunity when your recommendations go to them to weigh in and influence what happens then. That is the time for them to do it. And uh, Mr. Brownstein said earlier that she's entitled. I'm actually not sure that she is. I feel like this really gets at, um, it'll be, it's questionable at best her doing this and maybe and maybe worse than that. So I just wanted to say it, it really bothered me as a resident of district six and a resident of the city uh, it just, it feels like it is not ethical government, what has happened with this letter. And uh, I sense uh, from, I think, everybody on this commission, just about, that you are not interested in having people use their platform to try to tell you what to do. And I appreciate that about all of you, that you are here taking this work very seriously and are committed to a good process and an ethical process and we'll come up with the recommendations that you think are best for the city. So thanks. Back to the commission. Thank you. And thank you for all the members of the public. We have <clears throat> we had over 70 something people here tonight. So really appreciate um, everyone's uh, thoughtful input um, tonight. Um, I'm gonna go back to the uh, commissioners now. Um, I wanna get us to, we're gonna, we're gonna finish that item in terms of uh, the discussion of the options and we're going to go to the revision of the work plan because that's where we have an action item uh, capacity and we can take up the vote on the we can take up the top the the motion that was taken already because it's on an action item uh, but first i'll go to commissioner calendar you know i was trying to speak under old business and so i think i'll wait till we get to the work plan because that's where we'll be talking about the motion correct that is correct sir All right, we're going to go now to old business and we're going to be to take up the work plan um, piece. And I have Commissioner Siegel and then Commissioner Callender. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I am the lead of the subcommittee on accountability, inclusion, policing, and municipal law. And as the lead, I'd like to respond to the letter from the city manager. The letter was quite a shock and none of us received it until after hours around 6.30 PM on a Friday over a summer fall weekend for a Monday hearing. The city manager did not speak to reimagining or to our subcommittee before sending this letter out. She did not get their permission to make public comment about their process or desires. Um, if she had, she would have learned that the Charter Review Commission subcommittee on policing oversight is taking recommendations from reimagining public safety. We are supposed to be consulting with the public on this, and we actually are. The Reimagining Public Safety and our subcommittee are symbiotic. We're in a symbiotic relationship to each other. They work on policy, and we work on charter amendments. That said, they, gave, they give us input on the charter amendments as they would like to see the charter amended. We are not working in a bubble, making things up as we see fit. The public gives reimagining input and they give it to us through their representatives. We are at this point making progress on our charter amendment language on policing oversight. Um, that, and although we are in the learning phase and look forward to our remaining educational day of September 27th, and the half day that we have left for education. Um, we are making progress um, and we, we are taking input from Reimagining's representative, um, including Mr. Pancho Guevara, um, who, you know, as you know, had 30 different organizations reach out to him about um, their, frankly, outrage over the city manager's letter. Um, and if she would have talked to representatives from Reimagining or to myself, 
um, we would have let her know we are in a very collaborative working relationship and they give us input regularly. It's symbiotic. Um, and, and I will say that they give us input on what we are working on, but we don't give them input on what they are working on. That would not be appropriate. They're working on policy and we're working on charter revisions. So there is a division of purpose here. Um, there's a division of what's appropriate for the charter and what's appropriate for a policy. And those of us in this subcommittee are highly aware of this division. And we're working with Reimagining Policing and the associate, you know, through their representatives. Um, they're doing the policy piece. Um, so we think it's overreaching to cite the Reimagining Commission as a reason for us to stop doing what we're doing. But we should absolutely hear, I mean, what this letter and what all of these speakers has brought to the attention of our entire commission is that we absolutely should hear from the community voices associated with reimagining public safety. Um, and, and with that, I'm actually going to, I, I do wanna mention that spot, there was a spotlight article, I read it, it came to my attention which read San Jose wants to limit which city bodies can discuss police reform. Um, also, there are not three oversight commissions working on policing. There's only us in reimagining. Um, and so I'm gonna pass the rest of my subcommittee's comments to Commissioner Callender at this time. And just know we've got an amazing lineup for you on the 27th on policing oversight. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Callender. Uh, yeah, first of all, so we don't have a motion on the table right now, do we? No, not as to the letter. No, sir, not right now. Okay. Not yet. So, so again, this, this isn't going to surprise anybody here. You know, when I talked about the need to, for us to discuss policing, when I talked about how long Black and Brown communities have been waiting to deal with the charter reforms that our community really needs, why are we going to suggest that we, we send this somewhere else and delay this any further. There's no conflict with multiple groups looking at charter changes, looking at policy changes that relates to policing. I think what there would be a conflict on is if we do not take this opportunity to actually address what we know the community wants us to take up. The, the, the oversight of police is already in the charter. This is the proper form. This is the proper body. We are the proper people to be able to deal with this. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to find and make recommendations that make sense ultimately to, to put into the charter. So what, what, from what I heard, and, and I, I don't want to address the letter. I don't want to say right or wrong or otherwise, but I'm looking at solutions. And what I can tell you is I think one of the solutions is we should be inviting uh, uh, the the restoration of the the re, um, reimagining group to present at us at one of the um, at one of our hearings and so Mr. Chairman, I don't want to make a motion. I'm going to look to you to see if you'll commit to having a panel with the with the group to come and and testify in front of us. Just giving those folks three minutes. They have a lot more. They've been working on this, but we have a deadline. We, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving forward. I do not want us to be put on the back burner, but I would also like to work with them because what we may learn is some other things that we may want to consider in the charter and maybe one of the things that um, they're just looking at as policy. So Mr. Chairman, I don't want to make a motion if you're willing to go in this direction. Yes, Commissioner Callender, uh, let me get to other com comments. I, I would support your action. Is, is there any other comments before we take up motions? Um, so I think that the letter from the city manager, um, I, I just want to, my own kind of thoughts around some of it is one is it, um, and I think from the public's perspective, it also gives a good example of the actions of a city manager. In our discussion of a city manager versus mayor, I think this is a good living example of the reach and scope of what a manager does. The manager is the CEO of the city, if you will. And so they're taking, you know, she has the right to take opinions about what she, how she thinks that we should be running the city, right? So when folks say she's an unelected person and doesn't have power, this is an example of what the city manager does have power to do. And if this isn't something that you feel is the right way for the city manager to have that kind of authority, then that should be something that you're considering in our discussions of governance. 
Secondly, I think that the manager did a little research for us, and I just think that research is good to send to the subcommittee. I appreciate that from the manager around the city's perspective on these issues, these back memos, and the clarity of which she believes uh, in the independent police auditor's role and what she thinks is the direction the council's already given her. To me, that's good information for the subcommittee to be looking at so that they are accurate and not duplicative of any recommendations if they understand what the city's perspective is on these things or what their tentative actions are. The subcommittee could certainly still recommend to us that these actions be codified in a way which would um, exemplify the committee's um, strong desire to keep moving this thing forward. Uh, but I can thank the, the manager for her input to us. And I think from the perspective of what we've heard from the community um, and what I'm hearing from the subcommittee, uh, we'll thank her for her input as we continue to move forward. I do think that the duplicative issue is a, is a concern and I, I, I am, uh, appreciate um, Commissioner Siegel, your comments around how your, your subcommittee is already working in tandem with them. Um, and so I do think um, to Commissioner Callender's suggestion, I'm not sure how much all the rest of the commissioners are familiar with the reimagining history. I think uh, Mr. Estramera referred to it tonight in terms of the city manager's office running this and then the the, the original committee dissolving because of process challenges and then re, um, kind of being reestablished and kind of what their work is. So I would commit to bringing them at least a speaker from them or some representative to be able to describe the work and their scope and how they see themselves working in tandem with us. I do think the policy question versus the charter uh, question is one that's good to be clear about. Um, and I feel like we would benefit from that in our in our education or study sessions. Um, so I'll commit to uh, contacting the reimagining committee and seeing what representation they feel is important to bring before our commission, because I think that's an important um, discussion that we should have, especially um, <clears throat> in light of the city manager's uh, letter. I do think the city manager was also trying to tell us how the council or the mayor or both in some ways, how they perceive who's who's going to fix, you know, who's going to speak to this issue, and I think that was their desire in this in the formulation of that committee um, to take on the police reform questions. I don't think it was necessarily in their minds that this commission would take it on, except I will continue to remind folks that the last piece of the charge was about accountability, transparency, and inclusion at City Hall and. This clearly is somewhat obvious that it fits under um, this, the subcommittee's work fits under that provision of the letter that we received or the direction we received from council. Um, so at this time, I, if the count, if the commission's ready, I'd like to go back to take up the motion that, um, <clears throat> that was made earlier about the expediting um, of the mayor election timing. Um, to expedite that as part of um, <clears throat> our next actions. As I look at the calendar, and I'll look, <clears throat> I'll look to the consultant for um, a correction here, but it does, it looks like we're in the study session uh, on the 27th so that we could hear this. Uh, we also have a timing issue on the uh, next Monday's agenda has had to be posted today. So I'm wondering if, um, the first, the first Monday in October would be our earliest date to bring it back, which would also give us the ability to give, have the time to <clears throat> have the actual documents ready for the agenda um, and post them a week ahead. So I think that would be the expedited time frame. Uh, Commissioner Amador, let me get to you in one second. Um, that would be my suggestion around, I think that's as fast as we can bring it back. Uh, to the city clerk or does the consultant agree? Yep, that's my my take on it. If uh, the 27th is a study session, then um, September, as a reminder, uh, next Monday we'll be hearing governance structure recommendations ahead of the public hearing on September 25th. Monday, September 27th is study session on police and municipal law accountability inclusion subcommittee topics. And then October 4th is the discussion of the 
uh, public hearing feedback during the um, governance structure recommendations. Uh, and um, we could uh, include voting on the timing of mayoral elections that evening as well. And then that would uh, mean on October 18th, Monday, we would have time for additional study session for policing, municipal law, accountability, and inclusion. Okay, Commissioner Amador. Yes, thank you, um, Chair Ferrer. Um, I just kind of want to go back to, uh, you know, what my subcommittee was also talking about. I don't want to be, I feel like we've been bitten this miss. Um, I really want to make sure that um, as we heard, many of the speakers were coming from that uh, imagining, reimagining uh, police. So I do also want to give them a space and platform. And if it needs to be a motion, then I pass it back to my subcommittee, um, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Callender, to make that motion. Um, but I really feel like it needs to be somewhere where we are able to see it and we're able to agendize it and everybody's on accordance with that. Thank you. Yeah, and Commissioner Amador, that's I, I commit to doing that for sure. That that great. Will we have a date today? I know because you know, as we are all working on calendars and pushing in several dates, I know it could be very hard um, to schedule that time uh, in advance. So, um, would we have a date by the end of this commission today? Yes. So we can ask uh, the reimagined to come back. Uh, I don't have a date tonight because I've got to let me let me get contact them in as well to figure this out. Maybe I'll work with Commissioner Siegel to to from the subcommittee's perspective to do that, to make that invitation and to make it work. Um, my meeting with the consultants is on Wednesday. So usually that's when I can we can finalize these pieces and we'll get that out to Commissioner Siegel again for the scheduling challenge. Um, we'll talk to I'll talk to Commissioner Siegel about that at that point so that we can invite them to come and to be able to do that. So uh, we'll, deal, we'll deal with it this week in terms of the scheduling, definitely by Wednesday. Okay, great. And then another, uh, just on my second topic is, um, you know, I know that there was a lot of, um, from the letter, what I got as well from the manager was um, that of doubling the work or not having enough voices heard. Um, and so I think it would be a great, um, place right now for our consultant um, to give us how ways that the, he's involved with different organizations, right? What kind of work they've been doing because we haven't gotten a summary either um, and nothing to show the public. And I heard um, there was even a letter from the public that said they had no idea that this was happening. Nothing has been posted on Nextdoor. Um, I know we do our best to put it out on social media, um, you know, and contact different folks and do presentations. Um, but however, I know this, uh, this particularly was put onto the consultant as one of their tasks as well. So tonight you did have in your packet tonight the um, I wasn't going to go go through it, but you do have the update report from our community partners. Did you re, did you see that report? Yes, yeah, but more on. I'm I'm not sure if the consultant was supposed to put stuff out there as well, um, so the other than office, the organization. But, yeah, the clerk's office puts all the notices out. So if the city clerk wants to talk about um, what she put out, and maybe because of time, we could ask her to put that in writing to us in terms of the actions she took in terms of all the different postings that happened for the last uh, that Thursday kind of, um, public hearing, I think is what you're referring to. Um, so we can ask her to do that for us. I have a lot of hands I want to get to. Uh, Commissioner Barozio. Yes, thank you. Um, I definitely feel we're uh, moving forward with the work plan. But in terms of what was just said um, in public comment and um, in reference to the letter from the city manager, um it just clarity is this is this something that needs to be motioned is this just like a letter that we're going to acknowledge and move forward with um um not not taking her recommendation is this something that we need to decide um through a vote um i'm just wondering how do we get closure with this um thank you commissioner brosio my hope is that we can solidify our just um our options in terms of what we're looking at and then i'll be happy to accept a motion around a response if you have a guidance and direction but um, we don't have to respond we can respond if you want guidance in, on the response um, let's take that up as we finish this motion commissioner segura 
Good evening. Thank you so much, um, you know, for uh, allowing our subcommittee to do work that has been made very clear by the public is important work. Um, so like uh, Commissioner Amador, I want to also mirror the fact that we would be really um, beneficial to everybody to have some sort of commitment um, soon and as soon as possible to when we can have um, uh, reimagine come come and speak to us and so we all have the information that we need and to hear directly from the organization that the letter kind of seems like you know um, they're speaking on behalf of that would be great Mr. Matsumura. Thank you. I'm uh, just trying to make sure I'm following. My understanding of our conversation earlier was that we were talking about a path to actually go ahead and move the existing language from the subcommittee on the timing of mayoral elections to city council without needing to bring that back to the commission another time. Now I no, think- I No, 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 um, to be clear, um, what I was saying is we don't have to go back and forth with a letter. So my hope would be that we could agendize um, a vote, uh, a final vote on the mayor election change. You would receive, the commission would receive the memo from the subcommittee and the proposed lang charter language amendments would be what you would receive in your docket so that we would vote on that. Once we vote on that, then uh, we can we can transmit that to the uh City Council of this is the recommendation and here's the proposed language that we've approved. And have there been changes to that language since the commission previously reviewed it? I don't think so, but we actually have the draft language for the ordinance change. So you haven't seen that or you that that just came out. So you would be looking at both those things when you're voting. So there is new language that we haven't seen, haven't previously reviewed. I received a copy of that. Um, Attorney Vanny, who did you send out that draft language to? Uh, I sent it out to the consultant, uh, you the chair, the city clerk okay. uh, in our discussion. So yes, it would be something that uh, when we this comes back, we would include that. Right, so we could definitely send that out. And But it comes from the memo from the, from the subcommittee. Okay. Um, but there is there is new language. It's not only from the memo in the subcommittee. There's new information and content that we as commission need to review and approve. Correct. The language that is uh, proposed legal language for the ordinance change itself. What does the actual charter uh, amendments look like? The actual language for them, which is just a reflection of the memorandum that you asked for. So if we this is the language that actually does what the memo asks for. Got it, okay. Um, I appreciate that clarification. I did see when I was raising the confusion earlier, some other commissioners sort of nodding and shaking their heads. So I just wanna make sure um, for yeah. my colleagues whether that is clarifying for you as or well. We can be the better. Yeah. So the, so the motion on the table at this point is, as Commissioner Matsumura summarized, to move the uh, mayor election change recommendation that you took a provisional vote on to a final vote and we're trying to we'll move that up to the next available agendizable postable uh, slot which is the first is October 4. Um, that will give us time to get the materials out to you as well as to post them so that they can be in the public and it will give us time to agendize um, the, the actual item onto the agenda. And so it would go October 4. That's the motion that was um, that was made. Is there any other discussion on the motion to expedite the mayor election change recommendation that you've taken a provisional vote on? Um, any other discussion or questions? Any clarity that people need? Commissioner Matsumura and then Commissioner Percival. Thank you. Yeah, and and just for the sake of of being real clear about the motion, I, I think it also included uh, ensuring that the language that gets advanced to city council includes our recommendation that this um, be a standalone ballot measure. 
that yes, is, thank you. you. That is that is part of the record. And um, Megan, as you're taking notes, let's make sure that we have that as part of the motion because it was in the earlier discussion of the motion as well. Commissioner Percival. Uh, that was going to be my question too, because honestly, I don't remember <laughs> what we included in the original language. So we do want to uh, to add that um, for the commission's um, uh, review. Um, so if that's not added to the original one we submitted, um, I would like to make. It yes. sounds like we already have that uh, in motion already. So. That'll be part of the motion. Yes. Great. Thank you. Any other clarity questions? Okay, so the motion on the table is to advance the recommendations from the subcommittee on um, changing the mayor election date. Um, included in that recommendation is two provisions. One is that we get you copies of not only the recommendation, but also the um, suggested language, amend, uh, charter amendment language, um, and that our recommendation include to the council that it not be bundled with other items that are further recommendations of the commission. If you're ready for the question, I'll ask the clerk to take the roll. I will take the roll beginning with Barbara Marshman. Yes. Christina Johnson. Yes. Elizabeth Monley. Yes. Ellie Matsumura. Yes. Enrico Callender? Aye. Frank Maitsky? Yes. Yes. Maria Fuentes? Yes. Sherry Segura? Yes. Tobin Gilman? Yes. Oh, T. Tran? I see you join T. Uh, Veronica Amador? Yes. Yong Zhao? Yes. My motion passes, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, the next item that I'll come back to is uh, Commissioner Borosio's um, question about the response to the, to the letter um, from the city manager. Does the commission wish to respond to the letter? Um, if so, is somebody um wanting to give me direction in terms of what that would look like and we would take a motion on that um on that guidance uh commissioner siegel <clears throat> i'd like us to pass i think it's been talked about enough i don't think we should vote on it i'd like us to i would i would respectfully request that we not vote on it and we just move on um, and then my comment for reimagining is they have multiple voices, I'm told, that they want to hear. So I would respectfully request a day for them, a, a full meeting for them to speak. And since we're shortly going to be talking about um, our schedule, I would request, you know, some options and choices for a full day, not just one person. Thank you. Mr. Siegel, I, I would ask, I have two items that I have to... Uh, work with you on this week and so I'm wondering if you could uh, we might just set up a time where you join us on Wednesday if that's possible so that we can kind of coordinate this faster uh, rather than split it up so well and hopefully you're available at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning and we can add these two pieces together so it's Commissioner Segal's uh, recommendation that we not respond to the letter and move on um, other thoughts, questions, feedback, comments? Commissioner Callender. I was going to say note and file. Any other thoughts? Seeing none. I will go back to the um, agenda um, and ask the clerk for clarity. I've just finished the old business. I need to go back to public comment again at this point. Yes. Okay. Could you call the first speaker? Nora.
Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. What was the question? It's public comment on the work plan. Oh, I have no comment. Okay, Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. You guys have a lot on your plate at this time. Uh, thank you for your work and efforts. Uh, to reiterate some of my earlier feelings, uh, I really hope that with the uh, city manager letter that you can um, put it off for a while, uh, two or three weeks into early October. I think you can have better decision making by then, how you want to move forward with this issue. And the, someone from city staff at the beginning of the meeting today, I hope you can stick to that plan of uh, end of November to have some more uh, reimagined ideas uh, in place. Uh, it seems like a good plan and, and very much a thank you to uh, 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 Commissioner Magnolia um, uh, Seagal, who clarified uh, the issues of how they work with the reimagined task force and uh, that brought some good understanding for myself it seems uh, we're on a good track i think in august we were worried about these issues ourselves within this meeting i learned important lessons at that time and uh you know good lessons are still happening here and uh you know at this time that uh you know how a democratic uh, community process can work which is interesting i think uh, i hope i hope uh, it's just a process of, 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 of discussion and negotiation. And uh, I think we can do this uh, in good terms. And uh, it seems like these things can work together. I hope we can continue these, these things. And it is these, uh, it's an idealistic process we're addressing of ourselves at this time. And uh, I hope uh, we want to make those efforts to do that and, and, and to offer good terms and, and good words. And, uh, so good luck to ourselves how we do that. And uh, reimagine seems an important concept to keep on considering. And uh, so good luck how we can do that. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, the reason why I spend so much time, because I, I literally go to all of these meetings. I've been to every single reimagined meeting there, there's been conducted every single one from the very beginning until last week every single one and so i'm committed because i love my city i love san jose and i know what the chicano has experienced in this city because i have it in my family history my father has told me his stories. My mother has told me her stories. The Chicanos have told me the stories. UC Berkeley has told me the stories. Um, uh, uh, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, all of these colleges in their libraries have centered within them the Chicano experience in this city. And it has been tumultuous ever since the Bracero program. And so this is, this is very, very critical and important to me because it's about justice. It is about justice and having the, 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 the Declaration of Independence and, this, and the Constitution of the United States centered with respect to the Chicano, with respect to the Mexican. Doesn't he deserve it? I would think that the person that has been out there in the field swinging the, the, the short-handled hoe, doing everything that they could to make sure that Mija and Mijo went to, went to college, and they did. Do you know how many Chicanos are graduates of San Jose State University as a result of the fight that they have to put up and which the black berets were protectors they were our protectors the black berets were the protectors of the chicano community and so what i'd like to say to this committee thank you magnolia thank you veronica i come to these meetings because i know that there are citizens within my community that exist that are just like you that understand the issues that understand what needs to be done and then you go ahead and you you, you do absolutely whatever it is that you can do with poise with dignity and with Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, okay, good. Good. okay, good. Thank you. Tessa Woodman C from District 6. Um, okay, good. Yeah, well, I still feel that, like I wrote in my letter to you all, that the issue of climate crisis 
as an emergency that we are not addressing it good enough. And that's why we are in the you know world of hurt that we're in. And we're on, you know, as Antonio Guterres from the UN, um, head of the UN says that we are in the, you know, in the abyss. And every step we take is very critical at this point. And, you know, we're not taking the time enough. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you're going to you put that to rest the, you know, the, the decision about when we're going to vote and all that political stuff, because that, so that we can keep working on this plan, because I think that you guys are doing a good job and work to get all this coordination going, that we should keep going and get e equity in terms of the people's agenda. And so I like, like we have given seven um, full meetings to the political issues. We should give at least that, excuse me, to the, people's agenda and and also to equitably do that in regards to climate change because nobody wants to deal with climate change because that means a lot of degrowth it means a lot of you know changes transformational change that people don't want to make that's why we're in the world to hurt still and so like i love how paul said um you know what he sees when he sees the map is greed and this is where they say that you know we have to go down to zero and that it is the the rich countries that have to do it the most and do it faster. So we're, we're in a timeline. We have a timeline to make the changes so we don't experience catastrophic uh, impacts. And so we need to keep working on it. Caller 5140. I tell you, if we had carbon tax for all the hot air of uh, the people that are speaking, not not the callers, but all the people speaking. And I, I mean, I wish we could put a carbon tax on your hot air. I haven't heard any solutions. I haven't heard anything that's going to make a better city. It's just kicking cans down the road. You know, we're going to change the voting so it's every you know it'll be on a presidential election. Hey, look, it, if you really want to change something, you get out and vote. You get off your duff and you go vote like like I'm going to do. I'm going to vote yes for the recall. I'm going to vote for Larry Elder. Now, if people who want to support uh, uh, any twosome newsome, I hope they're gonna, if they're serious about voting, are they are they not going to do it because it's not a presidential election? No, these people. They need to go vote when you have to vote. We have to go have a huge process to do all this. I actually agree with Tessa for once in my life. You know, I mean, you, you're gonna you're gonna do all this work so it, it'll it'll land on, on, a, on a presidential election. You guys are crazy. I mean, this city is going down the tubes, uh, the bike lanes that are to nowhere that you could barely drive a car on. Who makes these decisions? Who's paying for all this? This city thinks that the money's never going to run out. I think they're crazy. We, you know, the, the, we have a city that disputes have selling beer because people might get drunk. Well, beer sales facilitate sales tax to keep the city alive. This city does the dumbest things. It, it really has to be the worst-run city besides Detroit, Michigan. The only thing we have here is a tax. Back to the commission. Um, thank you. I wanted to make sure that um, there's clarity on one point. Um, I did not take up a motion on the um, changes to which option you want. I believe that what I'm what I'm hearing from you is you want the expedited piece uh, plus the additional speaker. Plus, we've got to figure out the other half day. There's a bunch of scheduling changes. So at this point, what I'm going to go on is the assumption that we're going to continue on our current schedule with all of these changes worked into it. So um, we'll bring back a, the new work plan um, next month, uh, next month, next week, so that we can see where these changes in the scheduling will look. Um, but I don't think if we if we are going to continue on this current path, we're still going to have to make major adjustments to the schedule. So I'll do that this week and give it to you next week um, so that we can see where we're going to fit all these different pieces in working with Commissioner Siegel on the subcommittee's needs, um, as well as the additional vote on the um, on the movement of the presidential election. Okay. 
Uh, Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Um, we, as, as I think we've mentioned before, are still in our educational phase and um, we actually would prefer to present later than in option one. So for us, option two and three, anything that would push it out would, uh, would be preferable because we're still learning and we're still working with groups. We're still working with reimagining and we still have issues that we're just now exploring. So we would not prefer option one. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm saying in option one is just let's make the, the adjustments and see how we can move this thing forward. But um, the more time I hear you would be helpful. Um, it gives us a little bit more option too to get, get some of this, uh, the voting through that we need to be able to do. So um, thank you for the flexibility, but I, I do hear you. Any other items on the options piece? All right, the new item, uh, the business, the new business item that we have on the agenda tonight is simply a question around, do, are there any questions that subcommittees have of other subcommittees at this point? This is the forum in which we can make, we can ask those open questions. Seeing none, then I will move us to, um, uh, our final um, public uh, comment. Um, this is public comment on uh, any items that are not on the agenda tonight um, before we move to adjournment. So uh, the clerk can call the speakers. Mayor Beekman. Uh, is there supposed to be public for uh, open forum or public comment on the previous item? Quickly ask. I hope there is supposed to be. I had a comment. Just uh, quickly offer, if if not, uh, you know, I, I I really hope we can work on the subcommittee process that can have more of a. Uh, 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 it, it can be a step by step process when it reaches the public hearing process, so we can see what steps were at the subcommittee process that brought it to the public hearing process in the future. Uh, that wasn't happening. Commissioner Siegel very nicely mentioned it uh, at the end of uh, last Thursday's meeting. I hope you can work on that issue. And please work on the subcommittee process where meeting minutes can be available to the public. I mean, it really should be more publicly accessible and just easy to understand. And uh, things aren't being explained. Thank you. Uh, a, uh, a reminder that, you know, it's my real hope that the future of the strong mayor ideas we talk about are, are more... Um, uh, related to uh, procedural ideas, how it can connect with uh, the work we're doing uh, for the community and for the city council process. And how can the strong mayor relate procedurally to those ideas? They're simpler and they're not as complicated. When you start getting involved with a strong mayor and developers and money, big money, uh, that goes off into just, you know, uh, it just ostracizes half the community if not more, and it creates a system of government that's not very enjoyable or, or workable or practical. So, you know, we can talk about these issues in the future of the strong mayor uh, with developers, but it really has to be based on, on this good work we're doing now. And I don't think it, need, it should go very far, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, to conclude, I guess with my remaining time, I, I, I hate to offer, but are we having a possible earthquake coming up in 2023 or within the next five years or within the next decade? Can you talk about this amongst yourselves? And, and I, I'm sure you have some ideas, work for some answers. Sorry to bring it up, thanks. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, thank you for the uh, time and energy that you put into uh, um, considering the, the, the issues that are going to affect the context in which the next generation is going to live. Most of us are probably going to be gone. I, I, I don't think that very many of us are still going to be around after 25 years. Pretty much, you know, we're going to be fading out if we're not gone already. Because the way that society is accelerating right now, okay, what it's going to do is it's going to speed up the aging process. Because the, 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 the elderly, at that time, maybe 15 years from now, I'm going to be 70. I won't be able to keep pace. So that means the the oppressive, because I'm dying here. I ain't going nowhere. I will die in a tent in San Jose 
before I ever leave it. I, I won't do it. And so th this is this is this is what I've I've already submitted myself to that. And so the 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 work that I do as a citizen is deeply deeply rooted in what has happened in Sasipuedes. What with the pesticides? What happened with the pesticides? The Americanization schools—that's what they were called. And Elmock School District was one of them. So it sounds like unified. They were indoctrination centers where they built, the, where they beat the children so they wouldn't speak Spanish anymore. I don't speak Spanish as a result of that. That's how critically important these these, these charter issues are, because you have a son of a campesino now that is participating in the democratic <clears throat> process that he was denied years ago that my parents were denied, that I am now exercising now within this context. So, and the, the last thing that I would like to say is that to, to uh, uh, Ms. Matsumura, that I was wrong and that I apologize for my outburst at the last minute. Yes, thank you. Um, well, basically in terms of the strong mayor i am against that um what we saw with why this even this whole charter review came up uh and what you know it wasn't even come to the public it was only you know from public outcry that it even came because they were going to pass it right away without any input but it was all about mayor Licardo to trying to get um the more you know everybody to work on on the construction trades and getting development going and he wanted it to go. And there was a fight even with the planning director to, to fight it because it was about public health that she was protecting. And he wasn't. And this is where, you know, we're really having to deal with the political. It's really capitalism that has, um, uh, that has exploited people and nature for profit. And so when we're having to create the future, this is what it's saying in our in the IPCC report, humans would likely need to achieve a global philosophical shift away from the pursuit of economic growth and toward improvements in human well-being. And that's where the politicians cannot do the work of the people to protect the people because they're protecting their jobs. And when you have that money in there, it, they don't do the work for the people. They're doing to protect their jobs. And that's why we need the climate action to be in the charter because it has to be separate and that to do the, the work that you know is protect you know th that we have to stop the pursuit of economic growth growth towards the improvements in human well-being and we're seeing it right now even in regards to children getting so much covid and even what what's happening at the state administration that it's going to be hidden you won't know where the covid is in your workplace these are the problems Caller 5140. I just like to say vote yes, vote elder. Uh, get rid of these uh, politicians that are driving down our standard of living in the city, the county, the state, and the federal government. You clearly see uh, that Sam Licardo and city council have done a terrible job running this town. There's no amount of environmentalism that's going to save this town. It is what it is. Uh, this, if we're not careful, we're gonna run out of water because they don't build enough dams or manage the water properly. We've got spending us out of control, almost a billion dollars for police and fire that do absolutely nothing but uh, hand out toys and uh, you know, go on parades and march around. You know, they, they don't do anything. We have a lousy district attorney, which is in the county, but our police department does not, and is afraid to uh, press for prosecution of real crime. Meanwhile, they want to give people jaywalking tickets and traffic citations and these things. That's how they solve crime here. They don't. They don't put out fires here either. We got two burned out buildings in District Nine. Uh, one is a strip mall, one is a house. Those are the two that I know about. It's in my local area. Nothing is being done. Uh, we have a high taxation on our on our utilities, our phones, our gas, uh, our sales tax, everything for this city, and it's just never enough. And they want more programs to get to get rid of natural gas and do all these things. They're not doing anything. We have we have the highest bills there are 
for electricity, gas, and water. And our politicians pretend to be our friends and lobby to try to lower the cost. They should lower the tax on it because every time there's a rate increase, the city, the city council gets to gets to get a nice chunk of change for tax to go way. Expand police oversight. Yeah, hi. So um, I just wanted to uh, address, uh, I guess, uh, because I'm curious, uh, what is the point of the public comments? Uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, they've been broken up in such a manner that we are supposed to be discussing particular issues. And while I appreciate that this last section here is kind of a, a bit of a free for all, uh, what is the point in allowing random, overt, uh, partisan hacks to come on here? ramble about random nonsensical stuff and shill for Larry Elders. What is the point in wasting our time and theirs on that nonsense? Take my advice, cut them off, and let's move on. Thank you. Gabby? Hi, I just have a comment about the city of San Jose, and I would like, if possible, for maybe the commission members to visit a street um, called Palmwood Drive in San Jose, it's near Sorian King. And in the middle of that in the middle of that street, you will find a house that the whole neighborhood pretty much believes is a crack house. At any time during the day, you can drive through that house and you will see like a bunch of cars double parked. And if the police are called, nothing ever changes. So I'm just giving you one example of many. Thank you. Back to the commission. Thank you. Thanks to members of the public for all their comments tonight. Um, I am going to adjourn us to our September 20th, 530 meeting as our next meeting. I thank the commissioners for their service uh, and we'll see you next Monday. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.